afternoon. We'll call to order in just a moment. Stand by for roll call. Good afternoon, and I will call this uh, April 20th public hearing to order and recognize that uh, the land that we're talking about is Treaty 6 territory, the home of the Cree, the Dene, the Soto, the Nakota Sioux, and, and Blackfoot peoples from time immemorial, and one of the great homelands of the Métis Nation, uh, one of the largest communities of Inuit south of the 60th parallel, and a place where settlers and descendants of settlers can come together to try to build a better city. So in that spirit, I will welcome everyone and uh, roll call to establish attendance. Councillor Henderson. I am here. Welcome. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor McKean. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Nicol. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Briquette. As Aristotle once said, good afternoon. <laughs> Councillor Walters. Oh, Councillor Walters had let me know that uh, he's just running a bit of personal business. He'll join us as quick as he can, so watch for him to join us uh, when he's able. Councillor Banga. Present. Welcome. Councillor Carmel. Present. Councillor Good afternoon. Good afternoon. afternoon. Councillor Zadek. Present. Thank you. Councillor Essinger. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And Councillor Hamilton. Good afternoon. Thank you. So that's 12. Plenty to get started. Uh, I need a motion to adopt the agenda. Um, it's as presented. No changes. Okay. I'm happy to move today's agenda. Thank you, Councillor Essinger. Second. Second. Oh. I'm not sure. I heard two perfectly simultaneous seconds there, I think. Councillor McKean was one of them, I think. Councillor... Councillor Banga was the other one. But okay. anyway... I'll give it to no Councillor Banga. Um, please vote on the adoption of the agenda. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Zadek. And we're just missing Councillor. Oh, and it's come through. We have 12 votes, Mr. May. Display the vote. <laughs> Carried. Uh, next, then, is the uh, protocol items. I don't think we have any today. No, oh, okay. So I will now outline the procedures for today's hearing. The clerk will call out the bylaws to be dealt with, and I'll call out the names of people we have registered to speak to each bylaw. Next, council will select the bylaws that we wish to discuss and vote on any bylaws that have not been selected for discussion. Council will then listen to each of the bylaws that were selected for discussion and debate. And for each item, administration will first provide an overview of the bylaw, and members of the public will be invited to speak virtually using Google Meet. Those in favor will speak first, followed by those opposed. Each will have five minutes to make comments. The clerk will run the official timer. However, attendees participating virtually may wish to use a timer at home too. When the speaker is finished, please stay on the line as council may wish to ask questions. After comments from the public, council may ask questions of city administration. And after all of the speakers have concluded, I'll then ask each speaker uh, if they wish to speak to new information which arose during the public hearing. This process uh, can require some patience to ensure that anyone who does wish to address council has an opportunity. And thereafter, uh, Council may close the public hearing and debate the bylaw. For those participating virtually, please refrain from using the chat function in Google Meet during the meeting as it creates issues of decorum, provides unfair advantage, and interferes with the live stream. It, additionally, 
Please remember to mute your microphone when you're not presenting or answering questions. If you're experiencing any difficulties, the Office of City Clerk has resources available to facilitate communication with those participating in the statutory public hearing process. Please reach out using the contact information provided in your registration or via city.clerk at edmonton.ca. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.1, Charter Bylaw 19667, to allow for light industrial business activities, Rosedale Industrial? Yes, I have Grant Stevenson to answer questions only from Skill Zone Hockey. Grant, are you there? Hey, Council. Yeah, I'm here. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Welcome. And I have no one in opposition on item 3.1. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.2, Charter Bylaw 19659, to allow for low density residential development, Keswick? Yes, I have Elise Shillington to answer questions only from Stantec. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. And Chris Nicholas to answer questions only from MLC. Chris? Is he on the call? I don't see his name, but there is someone uh, that joined by phone, and they may be muted and need to star six to unmute. Okay. We'll give a moment for that. All right. Well, hopefully we can get Chris on the line um, by the time the item comes up, if it gets selected. Uh, next, 3.3. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.3, Charter Bylaw 19652, to allow for retail, general, commercial, and office uses that are compatible with adjacent residential uses and achieve a high standard of building appearance, York? Yes, I have Chuck McNutt to answer questions only from WSP Canada, Inc. Uh, yes, I'm here. Thank you. Good afternoon. And no one in opposition. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.4, Charter Bylaw 19666, to allow for a range of low density residential housing, De Rocher? Yes, I have Elise Shillington again to answer questions from Stantec. And Chris, yes, I'm here. Thank you. And Chris Nicholas, we'll try one more time. Chris, are you there? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I got it right this time, I hope. Perfect. Loud and clear. Thanks. No one in opposition. Items 3.5 and 3.6 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.5, bylaw 19647, amendment of the North Saskatchewan River Valley Area, River Valley Area Redevelopment Plan, or item 3.6, charter bylaw 19648, to allow for the preservation of natural areas and parkland along the North Saskatchewan River, Strathcona, Mill Creek, Ravine North? Yes, I have Trent Portugal to answer questions only. From Good afternoon. The, from the City of Edmonton, thank you, and no one in opposition. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.7, Charter Bylaw 19664, to allow for the development of ground-oriented multi-unit housing, Bonnie Dean? Yes, I have Jake Papineau to answer questions only from Ains Development Consulting Limited. Hello there. Hello, and I have no one in opposition on the Bonnie Dean item. Next. Items 3.8 and 3.9 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.8, bylaw 19638, amendment to the Walker Neighborhood Structure Plan, or item 3.9, charter bylaw 19639, to allow for row housing and low density housing Walker? Yes, I have Elise Shillington to answer questions only from Stantec. Yes, hi. Again, and Kevin Backus to answer questions only from Anthem United. Hello. Hello, and no one in opposition. Next. Is there anyone to speak to item 310, Charter Bylaw 19646, to allow for medium density residential uses, Grease Ball? Yes, I have Amy Stewart to answer questions only from Sheffer Andrew. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and Marvin Newman to answer questions only from Canada Lands Company. Good afternoon, I'm here. Good afternoon, and in opposition, I have Thomas Flavin. Yes, good afternoon, I'm here. Good afternoon. Next. Is there anyone to speak to item 311, Charter Bylaw 19651, to allow for low-rise multi-unit housing, Woodcroft? Yes, I have Chelsea Jerzak from Situate, Inc. Hello. Hello, and Jerry Rota from Stone River Developments. 
Hello. Sorry, you guys. I accidentally um, signed in under my mom's account, but this is me. No worries. Um, so, uh, and I've got uh, both yourself and Chelsea um, to speak at this point. Do you, do you have presentations you want to make? Yes. Okay. We do, but if there's no one in opposition, we can um, answer questions only. Okay. Well, I do have no one registered in opposition, so I'll note you as questions only on that basis, unless unless that changes. Uh, but at the moment, I have no one registered in opposition. So. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Next. Is there anyone to speak to item 312, Charter Bylaw 19653, to allow for the development of multi-unit housing, Prince Charles? Yes, I have Jonathan Rockcliffe to answer questions from RPK Architects. Good afternoon, Good afternoon. everybody. Good afternoon. And Stephen Hughes to answer questions only from Jasper Place Wellness Centre. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. And in opposition, I have Susan Zygart. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Next up. Items 313, 314, and 315 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 313, bylaw 19656, to amend the Ellerslie Area Structure Plan? Item 314, charter bylaw 19657, text amendment to section 930 of the Edmonton Zoning Bylaw? Or item 315, charter bylaw 19658, to allow for a variety of commercial uses and light, limited light industrial uses, Ellerslie Industrial? Yes, I have Fabio Coppola to answer questions only. Good afternoon. From Cameron Development Corporation, good afternoon. And Scott Mackey, also uh, on behalf of Cameron Development Corporation. Good afternoon. Hi, Mr. Mackey. And are you questions only, or do you have a presentation? Question, questions only, thank you. Okay, super. Thanks. Didn't say on my sheet here, but thanks for that. And I have no one in opposition on the Ellerslie item. Is there anyone to speak to item 316, Charter Bylaw 19660, to allow for low-rise multi-unit housing, North Glenora? Yes, I have Raj Dunna. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, here to answer questions only, unless a presentation is needed. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, and Jim Durr to answer questions only from Durr Architects and Associates. Yes, I'm here. Good afternoon. And I have no one registered in opposition. Is there anyone to speak to item 317, Charter? Sorry, is there somebody who is uh, meaning to speak on the North Kenora item? Sorry, just getting some, some background noise there. Uh, okay, next, Central McDougal. Is there anyone to speak to item 317, Charter Bylaw 19675, to allow for commercial development and high density residential development, Central McDougal? Yes, Chelsea Jerzak from Situate, Inc. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, Andy Kub Kubisi or Kubiski? Uh, yes, uh, I'm here. Um, from the Polish Heritage Society of Edmonton. And then I also have Mark Huberman to answer questions only from the Polish Heritage Society of Edmonton. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, and Ben Gardner to answer questions only, also uh, from Gardner Architecture on behalf of the Polish uh, Heritage Society of Edmonton. Mr. Gardner, are you there? Not able to hear you, sir. I can see that. Good. Checking in. There we go, perfect. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. And uh, in opposition, in opposition, I have uh, Warren Champion. I'm here, Mr. Mayor. On behalf of the Central McDougal Community League, and uh, just at this point, I'll ask everyone uh, who uh, who I've already called to just make sure you're muted, so there's uh, no uh, echo or feedback. Thanks. Next, items three eighteen and three nineteen will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item three eighteen? Bylaw 19661, amendment to the Oliver Area Redevelopment Plan. Or item 319, Charter Bylaw 19662, to allow for the development of a new commercial building, repurposing of an existing building, and continued preservation of a historic building, Oliver. Yes, I have Chris DeLabo to answer questions only from Belgian Development. Good afternoon. 
Good afternoon, and uh, no one in opposition. Items 320 and 321 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 320, bylaw 19597, amendment to the Strathcona Area Redevelopment Plan? Or item 321, charter bylaw 19598, to allow for medium rise multi unit housing Strathcona? Yes, I have Russell Dock from the Rohit Group of Companies. Yes, I'm here for questions and can do a small presentation if required. Noted. Questions only, but presentation available. Thank you, Mr. Doc. I have Tamil Benyon uh, to answer questions only from BNA Planning Group. Yep, I am here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Heather Chisholm, also from BNA Planning Group. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. And are you questions only, Ms. Chisholm? Yes, okay. questions only. Great, just double checking, thank you. Uh, and I have no one registered in opposition on that item. Bully for conventional zoning. <laughs> Items 322 and 323 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 322, bylaw 19534, amendment to the Garneau area redevelopment plan? Or item 323, charter bylaw 19535 to allow for medium rise multi-unit housing Strathcona? Yes, I have Michael DeWolf from L7 Architecture, Inc. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, and Jason Barclay to answer questions only. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon from HT106 Landowners. And then in opposition, I have Kyle Remfer. Good afternoon, Mayor Iveson. Good afternoon, uh, Gary Nash. Good afternoon, Mayor. Good afternoon, I have Cal Lang. Good afternoon, Mayor. Ace Lang Holmes, welcome. I have Megan Rich from Garneau uh, Community League Planning Committee. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I have Fred Hurley. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Good afternoon. And last but not least, Michael Flanagan. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. And uh, Madam Clerk, if we had anyone else register? Not that I'm aware of, but there is someone with the screen name Croy Johnston on the on the line um, that we don't have registered to speak and hasn't become uh, clear if they're participating uh, through the call of speakers process. Okay, so, sorry, Croy Johnson, did you say? Uh, so to Croy, uh, was it your desire to uh, participate in the hearing in some way today? Uh, I'm just here with Chris DeLava. Okay, on the Oliver item, if there are questions. Correct. Okay. Should we add you as a registered person or are you just here to observe? Yeah, I can answer yeah, questions yeah. only. Okay, well, we'll make sure to just get a registration from you for the clerks for the records, but, uh, but thank you for identifying yourself. That's helpful. Okay, okay thanks. Uh, apologies, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we've just had someone else join the meet. Uh, the name Jean-Francois. Uh, Debo, I, I don't believe we have them uh, registered either. So if we could just get clarification of their uh, role in today's proceedings as well. Jean-Francois, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, were you hoping to address one of the items before council? Just uh, to answer a question if needed. On which item? Item 3.3. Three. Okay, on the York item, okay. We'll uh, get your details and add you to the um, delegation of supporters for questions only on item 3.3. Thank you. Thank you. No more additional, everyone's accounted for on the meet? I believe so. Okay. Um, we've almost got this down to a science after. Yes, a year. I'm here. Thank you. Um, okay. So. Now let's select items for debate. Uh, Councillor Banga. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I would like to select 313, 314, and 315. Uh, quick questions from uh, administration only. Okay, 313 uh, through 15, the Ellerslie items for questions for admin. Thank you, Councillor Banga. Next is Councillor Henderson. Uh, well, just your advice. I had really, I, I don't need to select 3.20 and 3.21, but I'd like to speak to them. So I don't want to have to make them wait all day. So perhaps I can speak to the omnibus if that's all right. Um, 
I'd think say let's let's not select it for debate if we're not doing a hearing. Once the hearing's closed, we can sever it for voting sure, purposes. Sure, that would be perfect. I, I just, think. I just, yeah. Um, uh, but I would like to select uh, 322 and 323. Uh, Okay, um, let me just check if anybody else wanted 320 or 321 for, for questions or deeper debate. Not hearing any, uh, then we'll take that one for voting off the top, um, but we'll sever it so Councillor Henderson can move it and, and speak to it briefly. Um, so then, and Councillor Henderson has selected 322 and 323 for debate. Next is Councillor McKean. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have a couple of questions of the applicant on 316. No need for any presentation, uh, but I will select 317. Um, I'd love to select 318 and 19 because I think it's a cool little project, but there's no opposition. So I, I will not select 318 and 19 and Oliver. Noted. It's 316, 317. Thank you. Noted. Thank you, Councillor McKean. Councillor Essinger? I'd select 310 um, because we have a speaker. I'll select 311, but just for questions, no presentation required, and 312 because we have a speaker. Got it. Um, all right. Any other takers? Going once, going twice. Councillor Katarina. Mr. Mayor, I'll move closure of the public hearing uh, as the um, omnibus uh, 3 1 to 3 9. Uh, I'm not sure if Councillor McKean selected 316 or not. He did. He did? Yeah, he did. Yeah. Okay, so leave that out and 318 to 21. Second. Oh, I'm sorry, 318 and 19. Yeah. Perfect. So closure of the public hearing on 31 through 39 and 318 and 319. Those will be the omnibus. Please. Well, you can close the hearing on 320 and 321. Oh, and, and we can close the hearing actually on 20 and 21 because uh, okay. we're just going to yeah. sever it. For okay, so this is yeah. just closure of uh, the public hearing uh, as stated. Yep. Please vote. Close the hearing on the listed bylaws, including the first of the Strathcona items, 320 and 321. And we're just missing Councillor Zadig's vote. Yeah. Okay, yes. Thank you. You have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Display the vote, please. Carried. And then if you want to do first reading on all but the Strathcona items, Councillor Katarina. Councillor I'll move them. I'll move them if Tony's, is Tony there? Councillor Katarina, are you still there? Yeah, no, I'm here. I'll move the omnibus for first reading, uh, as stated, except for 320 and 321. Okay. Second. That's the omnibus then, uh, seconded by Councillor Nichol. Please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Zadek. And we have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. Carried. Second reading. I'll move second reading of the omnibus as stated. Second. Please vote on second reading. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Zadek. And we have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. Carried. And I'll move consideration of third reading uh, as uh, stated in the omnibus. Second. Thank you. Uh, to allow third reading to proceed, please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Zadek. And we have 12 votes. Display the vote. Okay. And Mr. Mayor, I'll move uh, third reading of uh, 19667, 19559, 19652. 19666, 19647, 19648, 19664, 19638, 19639, 19661, and 19662. Second. 
please vote on third reading of the stated bylaws. Yes. Thank you, Councilor Zadek. And we have 12 votes. Display the vote. Carried. Councilor Henderson. Yeah, I'll move first reading of uh, 3.2 and 3.21. I'll second that. That's a good one. Go ahead and speak to it. Yeah, I, I, wanted, I just wanted to note this. It was referenced yesterday in our debate on third reading on another item. Um, you know, and, and thank uh, Rohit for doing, I think, what makes all the difference. And the reason why we have a project which is similar in scale and in size is using standard zoning in an almost identical situation to the one we had yesterday. But Rohan went in and, and spent a lot of time with the community and listened to them and responded. And I, you know, I, you know, granted um, that stuff isn't guaranteed by standard zoning, um, but uh, but that work is, I think, one of the reasons why um, we don't have anybody in opposition here today. And and uh, and I think it shows that the RA zone can work. Um, they're coloring completely within the lines, um, and uh, in in a situation that could have been just as contentious. Um, but I, they really adapted to the concerns of what was being spoken to around them um, and have been able to answer all of those concerns. And the result is we have something here that's coming with, with the support of the community. So I wanted to recognize them for that, both for coming in with a good design, which they are already ready to go to DP with, I think. So that's why there's some surety around it. Um, but also in doing that work with the community to get there and to find out what the real concerns were so they could respond and adapt to it. And I. And I just think that kind of um, modeling should be commended and, uh, and hopefully others will follow suit. So that's why I wanted to pull this one out. So if, if people haven't had a chance, um, unfortunately, by not getting the presentation, you can't, you know, we're just doing the standard zoning. You can't see what they're actually putting on the table in terms of the design. But if, if you do get a chance or have had a chance to peek at it, I commend it to you as a way that we can do RA aid in these situations that I think that answers a lot of the concerns of the communities around them. So. I just want to thank them for that, and I wanted to flag it for everybody's attention. Yeah, they did uh, submit the presentation, uh, and it's part of the meeting record, so it's it's there in the attachments if people want to see, and it looks great. So, uh, please, if there's nothing further, please vote on first reading. Yes, until I get this computer fixed. Thank you, Councillor Zadek. And we have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. Carried. And I will move second reading of 3.20 and 3.21. I'll second that. Yes. Please vote on second reading. And we have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote, please. Carried. I'll move uh, consideration for uh, here to do the third reading of 3.21, 3.22. Second. Yes. Please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Zadek. And we have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. Carried. And I will move uh, third and final reading on Charter Bylaw 19598 and Bylaw 19534. Second. Please vote. Um, Mr. Mayor, I, I'm... I thought we were doing uh, 19597 and 19598. I'm sorry, I made my mistake. You're absolutely right. One five one. Uh, that, thank you, Councillor Katerina. That was a good catch. Yes. Uh, sorry, bylaw 19597 and by, charter bylaw 19598. Yes. Thank you. Very. Uh, so, are we all clear what we're voting on? Third reading of the first of the Strathcona items, the listed bylaw numbers. Carry on the vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Zadek.
and Councillor Paquette, we're just missing your vote. Thank you. We have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. Carried. So we'll go in order then of what's left, starting with the Griesbaugh item. Uh, Councillor Essinger. Um, so we've got speakers on that one. I think we should get the presentation. Thank you. Can everyone hear me before I begin? Yes, please go ahead. Great. Mr. Mayor, members of council, this is an application to rezone a 1.5 hectare site from RF5G, Griesbaugh Row Housing Zone, to RA7G, Griesbaugh Low Rise Apartment Zone. And if you can move on to slide number two, please. The rezoning site is located on the south side of Ad Astra Boulevard, Northwest northwest east of castle downs road between a local commercial site and a school slash recreation site the north side of ad astra is zoned to allow for row houses and low-rise apartments and partially developed the proposed zoning conforms to the griesbaugh neighborhood structure plan which designates the site as su the subject site as medium density residential and the designation allows for a variety of medium density housing slash high density residential forms including stacked row housing and low-rise apartment buildings the application aligns with the city plan by accommodating future growth for an additional 1.25 million population within the Edmonton's existing boundaries and providing increased density and variety of housing in proximity to transit and future LRT station. The site is approximately 160 meters east of the future at-grade Metroline LRT station and is identified as a new neighborhood station in the transit-oriented development guidelines. The guidelines should be considered at the time of deta detailed site planning. Charter bylaw, the Charter bylaw represents an increase of potential density and development opportunity from the existing RF5G zone that allows for multi-unit housing in the form of row housing to RA7G, which would allow for multi-unit housing in the form of low-rise apartment buildings. The key differences in the zones are maximum height is increased from 12 meters to 18 meters, or approximately four stories to six stories. The density increases from 35 units per hectare to 45 units per hectare. The front yard setback increases from one meter to three meters. And where am I? Um, a mix of low and medium density residential surrounds the site in addition to the commercial site developed with retail and daycare use to the west and a school recreation area to the west. The proposed zoning is compatible with surrounding existing and proposed zoning. Transportation planning has advised that improvements will be required to local roadways, shared use paths, walkways and crosswalks as development proceeds in the area. All other comments from affected city departments and utility agencies have been addressed. Advanced notice of this application was sent to surrounding property owners, Griesbach Community League and the Castle Downs Recreation Society Area Council. Four people responded to the notification, three had objections. Objections focused on density, that we prefer to see townhouses in lower density, impact of, on the character of the neighborhood, impact and enjoyment of the area, on-street parking and traffic is already a contentious issue in the area. The other caller supported the proposed rezoning. The administration is in support of this application because it will contribute towards residential densification, will utilize land and infrastructure efficiently, and is within 400 meters of a future LRT station. It is compatible with the existing and proposed development in the area, and it conforms to the Griesbaugh Neighborhood Area Structure Plan. Thank you, that is my presentation. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Essinger, did you have questions for the applicant? No, I have questions. I'll have questions later for administration after the speaker. Just for admin, okay, noted. Uh, anyone else questions for the applicants? Not seeing any, then we will go next to hear from the registered speaker in opposition, Thomas Flavin, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, councillors. Uh, I've never spoken before, so um, since you have no idea who I am, I'll just very briefly cover that, and I know I've got a limited amount of time. Uh, my wife and I lived in Beverly from 2011 to 2018, and then we uh, chose to buy a home in Greasebaugh, and we moved here in 2018. Um, my concern, our concern about this change of zoning uh, is, is threefold. First of all, um, we did take reasonable steps before we bought a home here. Um, 
with Canada Lands Company, with the developer and with the city to find out what would be built around us as there were a number of parcels of land that were undeveloped. And in, in our view, this represents a significant change uh, in the use of that land. And I'll, I'll come back to that because we've just experienced what it's like to have one of these buildings built um, in our backyard, literally. Um, second, uh, I wanted to talk about the adverse effect of building a building like this in this in this neighborhood. Um, as it is, um, I don't know if you know this, but at Astra Boulevard is used as a way for people coming south on Castle Downs to cut through Griesbaugh to get over to 97th. Um, the, the amount of traffic, um, the speed at which they drive, the number of times that they blow through stop signs, uh, in my respectful submission, that's all going to get worse if higher density building is, uh, if zoning is approved and a higher density building is built. Um, in addition to that, as it is, um, and I, I recognize this was acknowledged by the previous speaker, um, parking in this neighborhood is problematic. Last year, uh, we had a situation where um, an abandoned car sat on our street, in fact, right in front of our house for six months before we were finally able to get it removed. Um, and in my submission, those sorts of problems are going to increase um, as, uh, as density goes up. Um, most important, though, and I believe the word the previous speaker used was character of the neighborhood. I, I would call it atmosphere of the neighborhood. Um, on our little street on, on uh, Morgan, Morgan Road, um, it's a new neighborhood. Um, there's a lot of diversity. We have a retired couple next to us. We have a lot of young families. Um, we've gotten to know them. Um, we're on a first name basis with a lot of our neighbors now. Um, there's, there's a certain amount of turnover, but there's not a lot. And it's reminiscent of the enjoyable experience we had when we lived in Beverly. Um, in my submission, based on the um, low-rise apartment building that was built behind us after we moved in here, um, a building like that says to the people in the neighborhood, keep on walking. There's no interaction with those neighbors. Um, and I don't think there will be, um, simply because if, if, if you could see what I'm looking at right now out my back window, um, there's no opportunity for interaction with those neighbors. Now, I, I recognize the city's need to um, increase density, particularly given that the LRT is coming up here someday. But as you'll notice from the, uh, from the drawings that were posted, there's already um, a package of land, actually three, um, the one right behind our home, which now has a, this type of building, there's one down the street um, where construction has started in the last two weeks. And then there's a large one to the south of that commercial zone, which are already zoned for this type of building. Um, if this piece of land is also rezoned to allow that type of building, um, I, I honestly think it's going to seriously detract from the quality of life of me, my family, and the other people who live in this part of Greasebaugh. And um, I don't think it's necessary. Um, I think that the density that comes with, with row housing, like we have on our street, um, where you can still have um, fairly high density, but with a much better quality of life and a much better quality of, of atmosphere for the neighborhood and the people who choose to live here, um, is the way to go. Um, and also, without engaging in hyperbole, I think that if this also gets rezoned for that kind of a building, um, in comparison with the rest of Griesbaugh, um, there's a risk that you're going to turn this part of Griesbaugh into an undesirable part of Griesbaugh. And I'm, I'm sure that's not what the city wants. I'm sure that's not what, the, well, I suspect that's not what the Canada Lands Company or anybody wants. But based on the bad experiences we're having with the building behind us, um, I think that's where it's going to go. And as I say, there's plenty of packages of land around here already zoned for this. One of them's built. One of them's now under construction down the street. There's a huge one just south of here, and this would be the fourth uh, such package of land. And I would say, you know, the base closed in 93 or 94. This is a long-term project. If it takes a few years of the land sitting idle before a suitable developer comes along who's willing to build those row houses, then let it sit. So um, in my respectful submission, it should not be rezoned. Um, those are my comments. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Flavin. Uh, Councillor Essinger. 
questions, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Flavin, I hear you loud and clear. You're concerned about the increase in traffic because you already have parking challenges, correct? Yes, that's correct, Councillor. And uh, you feel that this would uh, adversely affect your neighborhood. Your preference is row housing, um, but you do recognize that uh, this area, this is going to be near the LRT and that's really where we want density to access that. Um, so you're concerned that there's gonna be more uh, density? I just wasn't clear because this is what's gonna happen over in this corner. Uh, that's correct. My concern is um, we now have a situation that since the building directly behind our home um, was open for occupancy last fall where um, the effects of that level of density in that type of building are being felt uh, specifically. Um, we now look out at a, a garbage dumpster complex and a parking lot. Um, we look at a very large number of cars um, with that building, which are also using Ad Astra Boulevard. This building would be essentially diagonally across the street, assuming it's gonna be a very similar building four to six stories with street level um, parking. Um, I, I see it as um, driving the, the demand for parking spots in this neighborhood and on our street um, on, on Morgan. And um, also I'm concerned, I would feel absolutely horrible if, if there's a lot of young families around here, if somebody's small child was run down on that Astro Boulevard and it's bad enough as it is um, because motorists who are traversing through here um, flout the, the traffic laws. So um, I think increasing density even further, um, especially at the cost of the, the quality of the, of the um, atmosphere of the neighborhood by going from row houses, which we, we quite like ours, it's quite nice. Um, you know, row houses can be quite nice um, versus um, a, a multi-story apartment building is gonna increase the density and therefore the traffic loads um, to the point where it's gonna make it undesirable to live here. Okay, I'm gonna ask administration about the traffic because they did mention there was going to have to be some mitigation about that. Um, and perhaps the, the applicant under new information might talk to us about the building because you're imagining what that building would be because we don't have any information, correct? Yeah, and I'm imagining that it's going to be no smaller than the one behind us, behind okay. me, four stories. All right. Thank you very much. That's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Essinger. Are there any other questions for Mr. Flavin? Not seeing any, then we'll turn to any questions of administration. Councillor Essinger. Thank you. Um, I just want to start with uh, the question about um, density, because I think you mentioned in your report that this, uh, the Greaseball plan was really designed for medium density, rural housing being one, low uh, apartments were another. Is that correct? Did I misunderstand? Yes, that, sorry, yes, that is correct. And if, I don't know if you can put the slides back up. The plan is that is slide number three, and it shows that area being medium density. So this would, would have been one of the options according to the plan? That's correct. Okay, and you heard the, the speaker really concerned about the impact of the neighborhood uh, with increased traffic and uh, limited parking already. I think you'd mentioned that at one stage that would have to be addressed. Could you speak to that? I will let my colleague, Mr. Said, speak to that. Yes, Councillor, uh, there will be, uh, in terms of mitigation measures, uh, the local road that is adjacent to the site, uh, uh, Lobman Street, that is already identified as an enhanced local which means that it will have um, uh, a wider carriageway that will allow two vehicles to pass um, uh, at the same time. In addition to that, uh, uh, in terms of uh, how much increase in traffic is related to the change in zone, 
uh, that change is uh, really uh, insignificant. Uh, what we are looking at is uh, an increase of about 10, 15 additional units, uh, which translates into um, four to five additional vehicles during the peak hour. So given that there will be, or part of the enhanced local is already constructed, um, uh, it will uh, be an enhanced local for this site uh, and um, uh, the traffic that will be generated by this um, uh, upzoning, um, uh, it, it can be easily accommodated. Okay, then. Thank you very much. Those are all my questions of administration. Thank you, Councillor Essinger. Any other questions for Edwin? Yeah, a quick one. Councillor Henderson, go I'm, ahead. I'm curious. I was just looking at RA7G. Uh, which is different from RA7, and uh, you know some of the some of the things that are being raised about about how it you know presents itself to the neighborhood. Um, I'm in my reading some of the things we've changed in RA7 to things like mandating um, a ground level units have have front front access don't seem to be to my eye in RA7G because it predates that change in RA7. Am I miss? Is that? I'm just wondering. If there's a if there's a hiccup there that we need to go back and fix in terms of that zone and answering some of those questions of how it fits into a neighborhood. So the way the two zones work, uh, they work together in concert. So the RA7G uh, points towards the RA7 regulations, uh, which include uh, the need for at-grade dwellings that address the street. Um, there's a couple of then, uh, I guess you can call them additional regulations thrown into the RA7G that supersede that RA7. but. Uh, the the ones that require street addressing uh, are included in the okay zone. good well I, I can see it it points on the permitted and discretionary uses it points back to ra7 um, oh there are direct development regulations to specified it okay um, okay all right well I'll, I'll, yeah so so what are the differences just out of curiosity because the creation of the greaseback zones predates my time uh, there's some additional height in there uh, okay. when it's calculated uh, from grade, and it's it's the height of anything greater than the eaves of the building. Uh, so it may grant maybe an additional additional one or two meters from the existing RA7, uh, okay. just in recognition of the different architectural characters. Right, so that allows for dormers and, and things like that. I'm just Correct. reading it. Yeah, and then the setbacks are slightly different. Um, if if there's direct access at ground level, your your front setback changes. Okay, great, thanks. I just thought I'd check because I never. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Any new information which arose during the public hearing? Uh, f from uh, either uh, Ms. Stewart or Mr. Newman. I have no additional uh, information to bring forward. Uh, Mr. Newman, uh, do you want to have any comments with respect to uh, the um, potential sale of the site and um, the build on it? Uh, sure, thank you. Um, we we have a party that's interested in purchasing this, purchasing uh, this parcel of land, and they, uh, they want to build a four-story building uh, similar, I guess, to the one that's uh, uh, adjacent to the uh, um, uh, the station. Uh, so that's what's uh, just driving the change. So uh, we're we we'd like to see some higher density near the LRT station, um, and uh, it will follow the architectural guidelines uh, that we have in the neighborhood. So it should uh, be a pretty high standard. So that's really all I have. Um, um, yeah. Thanks, uh, Mr. Newman. Any questions for Mr. Newman on the new information? Not seeing any. Then, uh, Mr. Flavin, any new information that's arisen in the hearing? Just uh, one point, uh, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. Um, I, I understand that architecturally it's not likely to be a uh, sore thumb. The building that was built behind us isn't a sore thumb. It's that the way the building is designed with one main entrance, um, there is no, um, there is nothing about it that's conducive to fostering a sense of neighborhood. 
And I think that allowing another building like that, when there's one just built and there's one under construction now, another one um, just across the street um, is going to uh, detract from the quality of life in this neighborhood to a, to an unreasonable degree. So um, that uh, that is all I would add. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Mr. Flavin on the new information? Okay, not seeing any. Then um, I'd entertain a motion to close public hearing. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm happy to close public hearing. Thank you, Councillor Essinger. Second. Seconded by Councillor McKean. Okay, to close the public hearing, please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Zadek. And we have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. Carried. First reading. Uh, I'm happy to move first reading of item 310, and then I'll just speak to it for a moment. Second. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, I'm supportive of this change. Um, it's really medium density. I, I hear what Mr. Flavin is saying is concerned about the impact of the neighborhood, but I think with the uh, traffic and the parking, the challenges aren't just limited to here, and I don't know that we'd have a significant increase. Um, not knowing exactly what the building would look like, but I know what Greece by is and the quality of, of development that's happened there. I feel quite safe to support this. Uh, I, I believe that it's not gonna have a significant impact, but it really is important to have that uh, density and this aligns with the Grease Ball plan from the beginning. So I will support it. Thank you, any other comments? Not seeing any, uh, please vote. <laughs> Yes. Thank you, Councilor Zadek. And we have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. Carried. And I'll move second read them of uh, 310. Second. Thank you. Uh, please vote. Yes. We have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. Carried. And I will move Charter Bylaw 19646 for a third time. We need, we need consideration. Consideration, oh, please. Consideration for third. So I'm moving consideration first. Thank you. Do I have to allow third reading to proceed? Uh, moved and seconded. Please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Zadek. We have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. And that's carried unanimously. Now I will move third reading of Charter Bylaw 19646. Second. Please vote on third and final reading. Yes. We have 12 votes. Display the vote, please. That's carried. Uh, next up is the Woodcroft item, which Councillor Essinger indicated she had questions only for administration, and we have no one registered in opposition. So I think we can go straight to um, questions of admin uh, if the delegation's ready. Yes, we have everyone here online. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Essinger. 
We'll also have a question of the applicant. Oh, you do um, have questions for the applicant? Sorry, I misunderstood. All right, then uh, for uh, Ms. Jerzak to begin with, go ahead with questions, Councillor Essinger. Oh, let me just double check. Ms. Jerzak, you're there? Yes, I'm here. Great. Okay, Councillor Essinger, go ahead. Thank you. Um, could you just uh, speak to me on how you've worked with the community? Because this project has changed since you first brought it forward. That's right. Um, so the original application for this site was to rezone it to an RA8. Um, we sort of came to that decision based on city plan policy for the district node area, um, as well as, um, sorry, I'm just looking at my notes here. Uh, as well as, sorry, the housing mix in the neighborhood. Um, so there isn't a lot uh, of six-story uh, missing middle. So we were looking at sort of contributing something in that in that realm. We did do quite a bit of community and neighbor engagement. So we prepared a mail drop-off to the neighbor. So we dropped off a letter in the mailboxes to 21 homes um, adjacent and abutting landowners. Um, Together with that, we directed them to a web page that we created for this project to explain the project, and that had a Google form embedded in it to collect some feedback. So based on um, that engagement, as well as engagement we did with the Community League, there was some, um, some concern around the intensity of the RA8 zone at this location in the node. Uh, it's not in the center of the node, but it's sort of around the edge of the node. So based on that concern and a recommendation from administration, we revised the application to RA7. And could you speak to me about any of the impact that this would have on the near neighboring homes for their sun or shadow impacts? Yeah, the um, in the presentation that I have that you may have access to, um, there is a sample site plan scenario for the RA7 zone. So that um, I believe is on slide seven. So it shows the way that a typical RA7 building would redevelop on the site. Uh, there are no abutting homes here, so the site is entirely surrounded by streets um, and lanes. And so there is quite sizable setbacks that would be um, allocated uh, along the lanes for on-site parking. And then there's also um, quite sizable setbacks around the front to allow for the at-grade accesses and on-site landscaping. So there is quite um, quite a buffer around the site, just given the fact that it's located on a bit of an island in the neighborhood without any surrounding um, or abutting single-family homes. Great. Uh, thank you very much. I think those are my questions. I oh, my final question is: Are you planning to put commercial in this building? There is no plan to put commercial in the building at this site. No. Okay. Because you could, but you, you're not planning to. No, we're not planning to. Um, if you just go ahead a couple more slides, you can see that site plan. Yeah, it's not as pretty as a rendering, I realize, but I'm, uh, I tried to put together something that would uh, demonstrate what, what the building footprint would look like on an RA7 site uh, on this location. So you can kind of see there where the landscaping would be, where the access would be, where the parking would be. And then those little sidewalks from the building to the avenue in the street would be the um, at, at great entrances into the building. Great. Thank you very much. That's all my questions. Thank you. Um, did you have you, questions for admin? Or just yes, I do. Okay, go ahead. Um, thank you very much. Now, the residents are quite concerned um, about the impact of these units, the current parking and traffic. Could someone speak to me about the traffic and the impact that that might have? Yes, uh, Councillor Slinger, uh, we have looked at um, 
um, the roadways next to this site and uh, currently 115 avenue which is uh, which is a collector roadway um, carries in the realm of about 2000 uh, vehicles per day which is uh, fairly low it's it's not a high volume roadway it is uh, served by transit as well uh, so as far as this uh, site is concerned uh, the increase in uh, density uh, will have a minimal impact uh, on um, uh, the traffic and uh, as mentioned by the applicant that there will be some parking accommodated as they see fit uh, based on the open option parking. Thank you very much. Now I've had some communication from the community about uh, they don't believe that this uh, development complies with the mature and neighborhood guidelines. Could someone speak to that? Hi, Councillor. Yeah, I could speak to that. So, um, as we outlined in our report, uh, administration does feel that um, although the application doesn't meet the locational criteria specified in the rigs, it meets the general intent of the guidelines. Um, it's also important to note, um, as Mr. Zach did, um, that the direction of the new city plan carries a lot of weight um, in comparison to the rigs as they, those are guidelines. Um, so we did consider the site as within the Westmount District node um, in the most recently approved city plan. Uh, does that, uh, one of the concerns I heard was about the height and that there should be a better transition to the neighborhood, but this has lanes all around it. So can you just speak about that? Yeah, so we believe that the impact um, is mitigated by the fact that it does have roads and lanes on all sides of the application. Um, you know, when you compare this to an RA7 that is directly adjacent to a single detached home, this does have the additional buffer of the two lanes um, and the two roads. And it's on the edge of the neighborhood, so they, they would argue about that, but it's near the transit center it's near the edge that would be correct it's near the edge of the neighborhood it is not technically the edge but near the edge of the neighborhood okay my, my final question is uh they were concerned that there's an atco pipeline access at this site and concerned about the environmental impact um we did hear that concern as well um, ATCO Gas is uh, one of the agencies that we circulate for our applications, um, and the shack would um, have to be protected with any form of construction. So we do not have that concern, nor did ATCO Gas raise that concern. Okay, I just want to make sure that I asked it on behalf of the neighborhood. Uh, of course. Thank you. Those are all my questions. Thank you. Um, See no further questions for administration at this time. Is there any new information? Not hearing any, then we will. Um, I'm happy to move closure with the public hearing. Thank you, Councillor Etzinger. Seconder. Second. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Please vote to close public hearing. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Zadig. And we have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. Carried. Thank you. I will move first reading um, of item 311 and then speak to it. Second. Motion is before us. Go ahead, speaking to it, Councillor Essinger. Thank you. Um, I know that the community has some concerns about. Uh, this and I and I've heard from the community league. They've they've shared many of the concerns, uh, and I've heard the answers today. I feel comfortable that we're going to be able to mitigate their concerns. I know they're very concerned about the impact of the neighborhood or this setting a precedent. But this is uh, close to a transit station. It's near the edge of the neighborhood, so I think it will align. So I'm happy to support it at this point. Thank you. Any others wishing to speak? Not seeing any, please vote on first reading. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Zadek.
I'll vote yes, but my it's not submitting here. Thank you, Councillor Esslinger. There are a number of councillors I can see are in the right place, but the votes aren't coming through. Um, Councillor Banga? Yes. Thank you. And Councillor Katarina? Yes, for me, Madam Clerk. Thank you. And Councillor Hamilton? Yes. Thank you very much. We have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. Carried. I'll move second reading of item 311. Second. Please vote on second reading now. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Zadek. Uh, apologies, the system's just a bit slow today. Um, Councillor Benga, we're missing your vote. Yes. Thank you. And Councillor Katarina? Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you. And Councillor Esslinger? Yes. Thank you. And Councillor Hamilton? Yes. Thank you. We have 12 votes. Uh, display the vote. Carried. I move consideration for third reading. Second. Please vote on consideration. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councilor yes. Katarina. And Councilor Zadek. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councilor Banga. Yes. Thank you, Councilor Hamilton. And Councilor Esslinger. Yes. Thank you. It's 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote, please. Carried. I will move third reading of Charter Bylaw 19651. Second. Third and final reading. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. Yes, yes. Clerk. I'm losing faith in the voting system. Thank you, Councillor Benga. And Councillor Zadik, did I hear you say yes as well? You, you did, and I agree with Benga. Is it, is it eventually coming up, or is it not coming up at all for you folks? Not coming up at all. For me, it's coming up. I can vote, but I can't submit. I'm also a yes, and uh, it, my system just straight up crashed. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Um, we're just missing Councillor Esslinger's vote. Uh, it is yes. Mine is not coming up. Thank you. And Mr. Mayor, we'll look into the, the back end um, to try and have this up and running for the next vote. And we have 12 for this one. Okay. Display the vote. Carried. Would it be beneficial to reset something well, and take a moment? or as, a, uh, as I think it would be a point of order is probably the most effective way to do this. And I'm not, because I'm not sure everybody knows this. If you load it up on your computer rather than on your iPad, it is remarkably stable. On your iPad, it isn't for voting purposes. So I'm not sure all the council knows that, but if you can load the program up on your, on your computer, you'll find it's very stable for voting. Um, I'm on my computer and I have no problems. Um, it's, I guess that might be a point of information, and I'm still not sure how those work, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, appreciate the pro tips. Um, uh, so, but sometimes uh, a, a moment allows something to clear in the system. So we'll have a moment here. I don't know if, if uh, clerks want to do anything while we uh, get the next um, presentation on Prince Charles will be a while before we need a vote if you need to do anything to sort of reset wise so um, I'll just ask everyone to, to mute uh, at this point again just to make sure there's no background noise there and uh, I'll, I'll ask for the presentation on the Prince Charles item uh, good afternoon 
This application is to rezone a site in the Prince Charles neighborhood from RF3 small scale infill development zone to the uh, RF5 row housing zone. The applicant has indicated that their intent is to provide 12 units of permanent supportive housing within a one three story structure. While the current RF3 zone also allows for supportive housing, the applicant has indicated that their design and built form would not work under this zone. Next slide, please. The property is located mid-block between 122nd and 123rd Avenue on the east side of 127th Street at the edge of Prince Charles neighborhood. Being in the middle of the block, the property is located between two bungalows. 127th Street is an arterial road which leads to Yellowhead Trail and is also considered a secondary corridor according to the city plan. The street will be served with both local and cross-town bus service under the new bus, ne bus network. Next slide, please. The proposed RF5 zone allows for a very similar built form to the RF3 zone with a few key differences. The RF5 would allow a height of 10 meters instead of 8.9 meters, side setbacks of 1.2 meters instead of approximately 1.35 meters, and a site coverage of 50% instead of 45%. Next slide, please. Both the RF5 and RF3 zones permit limited supportive housing, which allows up to six units, but in order to develop the 12 units as per the applicant's intent, they would need to apply for a development permit for the discretionary use of supportive housing, also present in both zones. Next slide, please. The proposed application aligns with the goals and policies of the city plan to increase density along key corridors and provide opportunities for permanent supportive housing. As 127th Street, is considered a secondary corridor, it is identified for low to mid-rise development. The RF5 zone, while allowing an increase in scale from the surrounding RF3 properties, it is on the smaller scale of what would be encouraged along the street as it evolves. Next slide, please. In conclusion, administration is in support of this application because the property fronts onto an RTO roadway, it provides an opportunity for permanent supportive housing, and the proposed zone aligns with the city plan for this location. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Essinger, did you have questions for the applicants on this one? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay, then we'll go ahead to uh, the speaker registered in opposition, which is Susan Zygart. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my po apologies in advance. Um, my presentation is quite uh, quite childish compared to everyone else's, but I did what I could with my first time with uh, PowerPoint. So thank you for your time. Um, my name is Susan Zigart. I've been the owner at the adjacent property to the north for the last 12 years. Sorry, when I bought Susan, the property... Susan, sorry? I'm just going to pause for a moment. If you've got a presentation, uh, I'll, I'm just going to give our clerks a moment to pull it up. And sure, we'll, thank you. We'll restart your time here. Okay, we can okay, see it thank now. You. Proceed. Great. Um, so, I've been the owner of the property for the last 12 years. When I bought the property, I immediately fell in love with the yard and its potential to be a beautiful home for me with some hard work and love, as it was a quiet neighborhood filled with character and had numerous mature trees and plants that have been there ever since it was built in 1949. Since then, I have lovingly spent all my spare money and time composting, collecting rainwater, building up the flora, and encouraging the native birds and pollinators to visit and feed. I have added fruit trees and vertical garden beds that have yielded an abundance of vegetables and herbs for me to enjoy and share. This yard is my sanctuary, and without it, I wouldn't have made it through to this time of social isolation and quarantine. Next slide, please. My main concern is the size and potential height of the fourplex being proposed. I have read the submitted report, the infill guidelines, along with the city's vision of infill. The stark contrast of what is being proposed is extremely concerning to me as it will alter my property and the way I live. Next slide. I have listed some excerpts from the infill guidelines which mirror my concerns about fitting into the current small interior lot of my block, such as the typical means of creating a developable fourplex site is to consolidate two smaller lots or to develop an existing large lot. Large lot. Next slide, please. 
Um, it worries me that this is not the normal R3 small-scale infill development that is currently allowed, that the proposal to change it to R5 row housing, um, in this case a duplex, has not been done in any other areas of Prince Charles unless it was on a corner or a double lot. Next slide, please. The approval of this rezoning would allow for the height to be 10 metres and is one of the main contentions I have. Next slide. The 10 metre height and mass of building allowed will block the sunshine that is currently crucial to maintaining my plants and garden, as well as my own enjoyment of just being able to sit outside with a cup of coffee and feel that sunshine on my face and relax. Next slide. Uh, again, my apologies with this PowerPoint, but I've tried to do what I could to illustrate with Google Maps a picture of my house and the property in question and the path of the sun and how it will block my sunlight, along with the other ex another excerpt from the infill guidelines that mention how design and placement should minimize loss of privacy or sunlight to adjacent homes. Next slide, please. I'm so proud of creating this healthy, sustainable yard and garden in the middle of urban Edmonton and believe that it should be part of all infill considerations in mature neighborhoods. Currently, I have around 50 birds that are nesting in my mature trees and walking out this morning and hearing their beautiful songs filled my heart with happiness. Next slide. Another thing I read in the infill regulations was that the recommendation that individual homes not be isolated between infill developments. As you can see from the picture provided, the house adjacent to the south would be sandwiched in between the current row housing on the corner and the proposed property in discussion if allowed. That particular lot has been vacant and for sale for the last six years and I believe should be considered a part of the development if such a property is to be designed. It would make more sense if the developer expanded outwards instead of upwards in this instance. Next slide. I hope you understand my concerns that while infill is important for our city and future, it is also just as important for our city and future to maintain and preserve some mature sustainable yards that benefit the rest of the neighborhood. Massive buildings with no yards and no nature is not somewhere I want to live anymore. Next slide. I will end with a quote that inspired me and it was taken from the Edmonton City Plan. Edmonton is a city of possibilities and passion. Our growth should drive climate resilience ahead and strengthen our natural systems. As a livable city, development and sustainability must be allies, not competitors, protecting and enhancing our land, air, water and biodiversity. There are many other lots available for larger developments such as fourplexes in this area, and I urge you to consider this in your choice as well as the consequence and the people such as myself who will have to watch what they have worked so hard for, along with their dreams, crumble. Please oppose the rezoning for this property. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Zigert. Um, or Zigert, apologies. Uh, Councillor uh, Esslinger, go ahead. Thank you. Well, you have a beautiful yard and you certainly have maintained it well. Thank you. Um, so it's really the impact on your home that concerns you. It's about the height of the building. Is that correct? And That's what correct. Can do to yes. the possible sun, shadow, et cetera, right? Exactly. So it's not the form, it's the height. Exactly. Okay, and I'll ask those questions of our administration when it comes to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McKean. Yeah, thanks. And I'm just uh, a couple more questions about that. That those pictures of your backyard were uh, really nice to see for, Thank some, you. for someone who lives in an apartment all the time. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I could see why you adore it. Um, do you, have you have you been able to determine for sure that the extra meter or so of allowable height in this rezoning? will have much impact in the growing season? Um, as I spend most of my time where it's nice outside, I actually sat outside 
um, quite a while before I considered um, writing this. And um, I watched the sun as it went past. And although I didn't take a measuring tape or, or whatever to to see how far 10 meters was up, um, it would definitely, in my opinion, restrict the sun, um, especially in the times where it's not um, as high. Yeah, I, I, uh, we have another uh, development coming up where there was sun shadow done and it often shows that in the, you know, in the growing season, uh, not that I should guess when that is, but it would be sort of starting soon and into the fall. Um, there's actually quite a bit of sun because the sun is so high in the sky. That's why I wondered if you were able to determine for sure that you were going to lose much in the way of sun um, exposure during the growing season. You know, I'll ask that question of administration, If, although I think Councillor Esslinger is going down the same route. but and Yes, I, I know every square inch of my yard, and I know for a fact there's, there's many plants that I, I planted 10, 12 years ago that have, have grown into really substantial shrubs. They will get no light because they're on the, the closest border. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for taking your time to come out today. Thank you very much. Any other questions for Ms. Sigurd? Not seeing any. Thank you uh, for being with us here today for the conversation. Um, and uh, I'll now go back to Councillor Essinger for questions of administration. Thank you. Uh, you've heard uh, Ms. Sigurd's uh, concern around uh, the height and the impact on her yard and if that's aligns with the infill guidelines on and the height. So could you just speak about that for us? Yeah, so I guess what's important to consider here is um, as it's currently zoned RF3, even though it is a bungalow next door, it could be developed um, up to heights of 8.9 meters. So that's an additional 1.1 meters. Um, typically, we would consider that a uh, minimal increase in height. Um, because this is on um, 127th Street, and as mentioned in the presentation, um, um, a, a secondary corridor in the city plan, um, it, it is expected that as 127th Street turns over that we would be seeing um, low and mid-rise built form in this area, R5 being um, smaller scale. Was any sun shadowing done as part of this? I assume not, but... No, we don't typically request, uh, or we don't request a sun shadow study for um, between something like an RF3 and an RF5, typically. So we don't have a sense if it will impact the neighbor or not? Um, we have a sense that the difference between the RF3 and the RF5 zone um, being only a difference in 1.1 meters, um, having a minimal impact on um, on the yard and the house to the north. Okay. Thank you very much. Can I say something? No, right. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid at this point we're now asking questions of administration. There will be a moment for okay. new information. I'll come back to you for that once Thanks. all the questions have asked, been asked. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Essinger, carry on. That's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor McKean. Yeah, Ms. Mickelson, what about at the development permit stage? Would there be any... Um, any reflection on the impact of the height of the building and the mass of the building on the neighbor so far as um, ex sun exposure? Um, if the applicant were to apply for a variance um, on setbacks, that could be a consideration. Um, obviously, height can't be varied anyway, so um, there would be no need to consider that. We do know that the applicant's intent is to apply for discretionary use, which all that uh, all they are seeking there is to go from limited supportive housing to supportive housing to allow for more units. But that wouldn't change the built form of the building. Are we at a point technologically where we can do quick modeling of 
a situation like this where we'd be able to show uh, the actual sun shadow impacts? It seems to me that we must be there by now so that we could do that in-house pretty quickly. Um, we could put the request in um, to our GIS team to do some quick shadowing impact. It's very hard to ascertain with mature mature trees within these mature areas on where that shadowing is coming from. Um, but it is a request we could make. Yeah, no, and I, it's sort of, I suppose, maybe not apropos of this specific situation, although we, you know, this kind of tugs at my heartstrings, a woman who devotes that much time and love to her backyard. And we're not, we might be able to tell her that during the growing senior season, you're not going to lose much sun at all, if any. And that that's that would be very comforting, I think, to her. But we don't have that technology, or we just don't do that as part of our reporting. Um, so, sorry, um, I'm getting a message from the planner that worked on the file. And in the slide deck, we did prepare some massing, um, which does show shadows on it. So if we do want to pull um, up the presentation for this um item we could have a look at that here it comes there you go you can see um between the r3 and the r5 it's difficult it, again it's not so easy to see because um of other influences which cause shadows but you could see the slight difference on the north end of um, the speaker's property. I don't know if I can see those differences, Ms. Nicholson. Can you put them in any kind of context for me? And that's not obviously the, the equinoxes or growing season or anything. The shadowing um, appears, what it appears to show is um, additional shadow on the RF5 on the north side of uh, the speaker and opposition's property. It extends uh, a longer shadow. Um, but, but, but we don't know for how many hours of the day or anything. That's the kind of thing that would maybe give her some comfort, but. Um, no, because the full sun shadow study wasn't completed. And this is, again, one we would have done in-house just for massing models that shows um, shadows. And again, this is the max built form of the RF5 and the max built form of the RF3 is showing the two differences there. So it's not specifically what the applicant might build, but it is their maximum building potential. Can't tell if I'm about to run out of time. And can we encourage the applicant to meet with a neighbor and discuss those kinds of concerns? Of course. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You're welcome. Um, Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And maybe just one more question on that, and we don't have to bring the slide back up, but um, that front setback is uh, assuming what would be standard. Uh, there's, But I'm curious if there's any, there would be opportunities maybe as part of that engagement with the neighbor to set the building forward a little bit more. Because I think the, the, the front setback on that block is a lot larger than I think normal, or at least it seems to be, I think it was seven meters in the, in the presentation. It seems a little larger than normal. Am I right in that? Yeah, the front setback would be determined based on adjacent uh, setbacks. Uh, what, I guess the question is, you know, in a scenario like that, if somebody was thinking about applying for a variance anyways, which it sounds like they're doing, um, or discretionary use in this case, but, but um, one thing that could be considered from the applicant is potentially setting the building a little bit more forward to offset the change in height. So I, that, that's something that could be examined. I, I don't want to suggest that's the perfect solution, but that might be a solution if they were to have that chat with the neighbor to see how they might address that. Is that something that, that we, we would, as a city, would a development officer look at that, especially if the neighbor was, was uh, supportive of a variance like that? Um, yeah, that would be something that the development officer could consider for the reasons mentioned, if it helps mitigate um, impacts on the rear yard, but it would have to be something looked at at the development permit stage. 
Yeah. I understand. Yeah. yeah. And, and likewise, you know, again, not knowing uh, if that height is absolutely required for the same number of units or if, you know, at the at the part that is closest to the property line, if there's a, almost an opportunity for a little bit of a step back and still providing that same number of units, that's something we wouldn't deal with here, but it could be part of a conversation with the neighbor to see is there a way to still make sure that they're getting the unit count they need and at the same time helping out to address a you know a fair concern that's being brought forward yeah that's fair and those are good questions for the applicant as well yeah so maybe a new information that might be interesting to see if they'd be willing to work around some of those pieces so thank you thank you councillor henderson well just for a comparator and i may be misreading this so if if the uh you know, on new information, if if it'd be useful to find out more. But looking at the Google Google map over, well, the, the the satellite stuff, it looks like there's some fairly significant tree canopy there. Um, and I I'm I'm guessing that um, that anything that we built would be unlikely to be higher than the existing tree canopy. Is that at 10 meters fair to say? That is fair to say, and that's why it's always difficult to ascertain um, sun shadow when we're at very minimal height increases in mature neighborhoods with mature tree canopy. Yeah, because I because the mature the, the the tree canopy the, you know the standard mature tree canopy I would think would be around the, the fourteen meter mark. I think that's one of the reasons why we um, we used that as a template years ago. I heard that rumor. I've never been able to substantiate it. Um, okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. Um, can't see the list if there are any other questions for administration. Not seeing any. Um, perhaps first to Mr. Rockcliffe under new information if you had any response to what's been discussed so far. Um, nothing directly. Uh, I, um, I did appreciate the, um, uh, the photographs of the neighbor's backyard and uh, the lovely backyard. I guess what I I could say um, in support of the project um, uh, a couple of things. Uh, we will have a landscape architect working with us on the project. And uh, so, you know, um, the landscaping for the new development will be, uh, you know, will definitely meet or exceed the, the zoning bylaw. Um, the d new development uh, will likely not have a garage. So, you know, that might uh, help uh, bring more daylight into the backyard. Um, and I guess, yeah, we'll definitely take into consideration some of the comments that were made by, uh, by, uh, by council, um, such as moving the building forward. Uh, nothing else from me. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Mr. Rockcliffe on that? Yes, Council, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Essinger, go ahead. Um, Mr. Rockcliffe, uh, you said you're, I just want to make sure that I have this right, you are willing to work with the neighbor, you understand from today the impact on the neighbor's concern, and you, you would be willing to adjust as you're able in order to help address that. Is that what I heard? I guess I, I would have to take direction from my client on, on that. I mean, uh, uh, I, if, if they instructed me to do so, I, I, I wouldn't have a problem with that. And would you take that back to your client to let them know the concerns that were presented? Definitely. Well, uh, and that client is on the line as well. Maybe that client will speak under new information and assure us that they will be aware of that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Um, yeah, I'm just a little bit curious why the need for, you know, because RF3 and RF5 in this circumstance are very similar. Um, so why, why I'm really struggling with what an extra meter gets you. Um, can you just give us some sense of it? Because really that's the only change, right? Sorry, is that a question for yeah. me or yeah, administration? No, um, for you, yeah. Um, well, uh, I'm just trying to remember, uh, and maybe administration can help me on this front, but, uh, you know, I, th I th it, it's, uh, uh, it's a building height issue, but, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember if it's uh, a building use issue as well. Maybe they could help me on that front. Yeah, 
No, I, I don't think it is. I mean, their report. I can uh, get back to the report. Just, so. I, know, I know it's not my time to speak, uh, but... Well, okay, mm -hmm. I'll get you in a sec then. Yeah. Yeah, just stand um, so by, you, please. Okay, so yeah. you don't have an answer. So, so the, reason that, the reason to do... I, but, but I do... Council has okay, so I'll the come back and ask you that you question when time comes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so well, there will be new information for Mr. Hughes, it sounds like. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Hughes. Yeah, um, and thank you for uh, letting me speak on this. And uh, unfortunately, uh, due to COVID, we had a public consultation that was organized with the Community League that was cancelled uh, last summer, and we do have another one planned uh, for this summer to coincide with our development permit. Um, our, our vision uh, of our lot is to include a fruit forest and a community garden. Uh, so I think our values are are tightly aligned with uh, what we'd like to, to see there. Um, our building actually will not be greater than the RF3. We were, I think we're a little less than 8.9 because of the mature neighborhood overlay um, at any rate. But the RF5 is a critical piece to um, the variance for uh, supported living. That That's the, the key piece to that. Um, we, we would love to have been able to utilize RF3. That would have saved us a lot of grief on multiple lots around the city, but uh, it was a determination of administration that RF5 is a minimum that we require for them to comfortably make uh, the required variances. As far as the front yard setback goes, um, it's a frustration of ours on every project we do because we're forced to put our buildings back um, to meet the average of the building frontages along the, build, uh, the blocks we build on. Um, so we would love to push that as far uh, to the street as we possibly could, but ultimately that'll come down to administration on how far they let us go. So we will do whatever the city lets us do. Uh, on that uh, front. Um, and like I say, w when when it's a safer time, we would love to reach out to uh, Ms. Siegert and show her our vision of what we see that, that lot. And she can see other buildings that we have in the city that will hopefully give her comfort that we are on the same page as it relates to ecology. Um, our building will be net zero, uh, water usage, composting, um, and developing a community asset that will provide food, not just for our residents, but for the neighborhood at large. If there are any questions, I can take uh, those right now. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor uh, Esslinger, did you have questions on any of that? Yes, I did. So, uh, Mr. Hughes, um, I, I just wanted to make sure I've heard it clearly that you are going to reach out to the neighbor, Ms. Seigert, and work with her. You've heard her concerns. Um, about the impact on her backyard. And it sounds to me you want to develop your own backyard, so you understood that. Um, well, we want to it. develop our entire lot, um, and it'll come down to... So the ones we've done in the past, unfortunately, um, nobody's allowed us to move our building forward. So we, we end up with a large front yard uh, rather than a large backyard. Um, and that's just the the way the ball bounces for you know, interpreting zoning regulations. So um, it, moving your building forward uh, is a major variance. And so, uh, you know, it's it's really out of our hands. We'll, we will try to do it, but it, it's not up to us to allow that to happen. That's up to administration to allow that to happen. I think you also said that you were really building uh, to the RF3 height of 8.9, but you were looking for RF5 so you can, uh, for the form, not the height. Correct. Yeah. So currently that's what would be allowed is the RF3, okay. And you are going to be working with the community and the neighbor uh, on this matter into the future. Correct, yeah. The, the, the community league will be involved in how we move this forward. Our, our, our goal is to create a community asset. We, we want to be part of the neighborhood. We want to house people that are in the neighborhood. We want to create um, uh, food security and food literacy um, for the neighborhood based on our our garden. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and Councillor Henderson, did you have further questions or no? Okay, okay. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Hughes? Not seeing any, thank you for bearing with us, uh, Ms. Sigurd. Um, now is your opportunity to respond to new information. 
Uh, thank you. Um, so there's a lot of additional information that has been provided. Um, in my world, 1.2 meters is a huge difference. So um, if they've confirmed that they are sticking with the zone three height, um, that I won't discuss anymore. Um, there was another mention of the tree canopy. Um, all those tree canopies that you see in there, apart from one that the developer has said that they're going to destroy already, um, are all my trees. So everything I have in my yard is built around um, not getting the shadow from those trees. And the next thing I have, um, the concept of having a community garden and yard sounds absolutely wonderful, but I'd like to know how on earth you'd be able to fit or how big this yard will be if you've got a single interior lot and there's going to be 12 residents in there. How big is this yard going to be? There's only maybe, what, five feet, if that, left in the yard, in the lot? So, I'm not uh, sure if that's a the, question. Sorry, uh, yeah, but and, I'll, and the structure, I'll just, I'll take sorry, a step Mr. Back. Hughes, please. Sorry, yeah. it, it, um, I, I apologize. So, this, no, we're, we're Hughes, only utilizing sorry, please. Um, 50% of yeah, the lot. Yeah, please mute Mr. Hughes. Sorry. Unfortunately, the process, well, and for good reason, doesn't isn't really set up to allow crosstalk between um, uh, uh, panelists. It's only a presentation. So, um, Ms. Sigurd, we, we hear that question, but there isn't really an opportunity to ask that directly of the applicant. However, there may be uh, follow-up questions and an additional round of new information if necessary. Um, uh, but Great. I've I'd love to speak to more to the, with the developers. I mean, nobody's ever ever come and said anything to me, and um, I'm quite happy to work with people in the neighborhood. But um, again, like I said, this is the first I've heard. Understood. Understood. Did you have anything more to add at this point? Um, no, I'm just just my interest in making sure um, what happens. Understood. Um, any questions for Ms. Zeigert on the new information? I have a question, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead, Councillor Ratzinger. Um, Ms. Zeigert, it sounds like you feel better now that the height isn't the 10 meters, but the 8.9, that, that that point has been addressed. Uh, is that correct? That is correct, but I think there's been a lot of... Just It just seems like there... They're, they're providing this additional information about this yard and garden and um, just as a last resort um, to sort of appease what I've said. But, um, yeah, I guess uh, that was my biggest concern, and um, I just hope that it's adhered to. And, and I think we heard that the, with the pandemic, the engagement did happen, but there was a commitment to work with you from the applicant that they would be outreaching to you. So I trust that that's going to be able to support the work going forward. So I think you said you wanted to work with them. I just want to clarify that. Yep, for sure. I'd be willing to. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other new information? I know, uh, Mr. Hughes, you were trying to get in earlier. Uh, did you have further new information? Well, uh, I'll just I'll just make the commitment that I will reach out to Ms. Sager uh, with our with our team, and just so she knows, this is not a, a fly by night attempt to uh, only appease her. We we actually have forty community gardens throughout the city of Edmonton, and we've been operating community gardens um, since two thousand and five, uh, in good faith throughout the community. So. Um, I, know, I know my word is worth nothing to you at this point, but I, I will reach out to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. Any questions for Mr. Hughes on the new information? Any other new information? Uh, would I be able to yeah, just Mr. make Rockliffe. one further comment? Mr. Rockliffe, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess just uh, uh, one other thing that we're doing with the development, which uh, uh, probably should have been noted is uh, we're not building to the side yard setback. Um, uh, we're actually, um, you know, normally the setback would be about four feet and we're actually going to be setting the building back about six and a half feet. 
So, you know, that will help uh, in terms of the sun shadows uh, on the neighboring yard. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Rockliffe on the new information? Not seeing any. Uh, Ms. Zeigert, any last new information? Nope. I'll leave it to the powers that be and hope that this all works out. Otherwise, I'll be pretty unhappy. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Okay, I think that's all the new information. So I'd entertain a motion to close the public hearing now. I'll move to close public hearing. Second. Thank you, Councillor Essinger. Seconded by mm -hmm. Councillor McKean. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Zadek. Yes, for me too, please. Thank you, Councillor Banga, and we have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. Carried. Thank you, and I will move first reading of item 312. And Thank you, and seconded by Councillor McKean. And speaking to it, go ahead, Councillor Essinger. Thank you, and uh, I certainly appreciated Ms. Seigert coming today. And I mean, beautiful yard. I wouldn't want to see that destroyed through this process either. And I was, I, I'm supportive of this because I think it's a good place for it. But the impact on our neighbors is so important. And I was really pleased to hear that the applicant will work with uh, the neighbor and the community. And um, I'm gonna hold them to it because I, I think it's so important. Um, I heard about the side setback. I heard about the height staying at 8.9, um, which it could be at uh, RF3 now. So I uh, trust him that the impact to the neighbors will be limited and that they will be good neighbors and good community members. Um, I will support this. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Any others wishing to speak? Councillor McKean? Yeah, thanks. And uh, all the things that Councillor Esslinger just said, but just to add that I know that the proponent um, has a lot of credibility with me and um, is doing work on one of our highest priorities in housing. So I wanted to applaud that. And, uh, and I know they're uh, they're a really good corporate citizen, and I'm confident, too, that they'll work uh, with M Ms. Ziegert next door. I'm a little frustrated by the front setback um, problem, as described to us by Mr. Hughes, but I don't know what to do with that at the moment. Uh, I hope we show some flexibility, or the development officer shows a little flexibility in this case. But anyways, I'll be supporting it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor McKean. Anyone else wishing to speak? Not seeing any, please vote on first reading. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councilor Katarina. Yes. Thank you, Councilor Zadek, and the vote should be coming through now. Apologies, there, there are four councillors. I can see that you're in the system. It's just not coming through. So, Councillor Banga. Uh, Councillor Esslinger. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Yep. Thank you. Councillor Paquette. Yes. Thank you. And just looping back to Councillor Banga, um, if you could just provide your vote verbally, please. Yes. Thank you. We have 12 votes. Thank you. Display the vote. Carried. I move second reading of item 312. Second. And second reading. Yes, Madam Clerk. 
Thank you, Councillor Caterina. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Councillors Hamilton and Benga. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Essinger. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Zadek and Councillor Parkat. We're just missing your vote. Yes. Thank you. We have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote, please. Carried. I'll move consideration for third reading. Seconder for that. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, I second, yeah. Um, thank you, please vote. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Benga. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Hesslinger. And we have 12 votes. Mr. Yes. Oh, thank you, Councillor Zadig. We thank do you. have 12 votes. Display the vote. Carried. And third and final. I'll move third and final reading of Carter Bylaw 19653. Second. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Please vote. Thank yes. You. Thank you, Councillors Katarina yes. and Zadok. And we have 12 votes. Display the vote, please. And that's carried. Next, then, is uh, the Ellerslie item, which I think Councillor Banga had selected just uh, to direct some questions at administration. So I think we could certainly start on that here. Um, I've got to make a intergovernmental phone call here just to follow up on budget. So I'm going to pass the chair to Councillor Henderson to drive uh, for the moment, and um, I'll rejoin you after uh, the break as soon as I can. So, Councillor Henderson, if you could take the chair. Will do. So, Councillor Banga, you just had questions of admin on this? Yes, please. All right, off you go. Thank you. I realize uh, that uh, there is no opposition to this item. Uh, of course, uh, everyone was properly notified. My question is uh, uh, the comment that all comments from civic departments, uh, they were all addressed. Was traffic one of those uh, concerns? And if so, what are the plans for that? Thank you, Councillor. I'll ask uh, my colleague, Mr. Saeed, to reply to that. Uh, the first answer is yes, transportation was uh, was a participant in the circulation. And now I'll uh, pass it over to Mr. Saeed. Councillor Banga, uh, the report also does have a separate heading that talks about the transportation and transit comments. So in addition to what Mr. Heinrich said, yes, transportation has reviewed this proposal and supports it. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Councillor Banga? I think uh, Councillor Banga was muted. No, I'm good. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Do you have more questions? Yeah. Uh, actually, I didn't even get the answer for my first question okay. because... Okay, all right. You... Then, then uh, why don't we... Um... Yeah, if we can go back, we probably should reset the time. Councillor, was there a specific question about uh, the transportation? I, I don't think he heard the answer from... My from question Mr. was, uh, was uh, traffic uh, congestion on this road any concern in the approval or at least the recommendation of approval of this, um, uh, this application? Thank you. I'll just pass it over to Mr. Saeed to give an overview of the uh, review of the surrounding network. Mm, yes, uh, we looked at uh, the Parsons Road uh, uh, that has the direct access to the site. 
and will be the primary access. Uh, if we look at the current condition, uh, Parsons Road is uh, fairly congested um, uh, because it is just a two-lane road. It carries uh, between 19 to 22,000 daily traffic, which is more uh, like it is at capacity uh, for most of the day. Uh, when we looked at this proposal, we looked at um, it from a, uh, a long term uh, and uh, uh, the ultimate uh, cross section of Parsons Road, which is going to be a four lane roadway. And uh, the anticipated daily volumes could be uh, that could be accommodated is in the range of 40,000. So based on that and uh, with the. Uh, uh, um, with the commercial, like we don't have the details of what the uh, 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 who the tenant is going to be, but we made some estimates, and uh, uh, there will be increase along that uh, corridor. Uh, but that could be accommodated with a four lane roadway. So uh, just um, let me know if I'm wrong. Uh, the new zoning allows for hotels, casinos, and gaming. Um, etc. Is uh, is that what your uh, uh, I guess prognosis of the situation is? Uh, and uh, would uh, that be still under forty thousand if all that is developed? Like I said, uh, we don't know the specifics. So typically, what we do, we take uh, uh, an aggregate trip rate which is a combination of uh, different land uses that does include these type of land uses. So that that is the starting point and with the limited information, that's how we estimate the trips. Okay, so uh, considering the uh, congestion on this road there, at what stage does the administration looks at uh, should it be doubled or uh, tripled, whatever the case may be? This is a arterial road, is it? That is correct. Uh, this is an arterial road. Uh, typically, we start looking at the widening options around uh, 14, 15,000 daily traffic as it is reaching. Uh, this road uh, has been on uh, the priority. Uh, unfortunately, there is no funding available. It is city's uh, obligation. Uh, the, the road that has been developed is constructed by the developer. The remaining portion of the road is, uh, um, is um, uh, like, uh, like I said, is, is uh, city's obligation. So we do have uh, an unfunded profile for this roadway, and uh, the timelines of construction are unknown at this time. Okay. And uh, you said it's uh, city's responsibility. Is there... Uh uh, does the developer has nothing to do with it? Uh, the developer already constructed the first two lanes. Uh, uh, signalization at uh, the intersection is also done by the developer. And uh, to serve this site, uh, an extension of Elwood Drive will be done to the west. Uh, that will also be uh, land dedication from the developer and the construction as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, I guess uh, the only thing left for me to do is uh, uh, moving uh, the closer of the public hearing if there are no other questions. Well, I, let me see. I will call for new information. Hearing none, uh, Councillor Katarina has a hard stop right at 3.30, but we might be able to get the three readings in before then. So uh, Councillor Banga has moved... Um, uh, closure, so please vote. Is there a seconder? Second. Please vote. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councilor yes. Katarina. Thank you, Councilor Bain. Thank you, Councilor Zadek. Yes. Thank you, Councilor Hamilton, and the vote should be coming through now. And we have 11 votes. Display the vote, please. That's passed. Mr. Chair, I would love to move uh, the first reading for uh, for the items uh, 313, 314, 315. Second. Anybody wishing to speak to that? Please vote. Yes, Madam Clerk. 
Thank you, yes. Councillor Katarina. Thank you, Councillor Zadek. And we have 11 votes. Display the vote, please. That's passed. Councillor Banga. I'd like to move the second reading for items. Okay. Do we have a, do we have a uh, seconder? Second. Second. Please vote. Yes, Madam Clerk. Yes. Thank you, Councillors Katarina and Zadek. And we have 11 votes. Please display the vote. With that done, I passed. would yep. move okay. the consideration to allow the third reading to proceed, please. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, for con on consideration, please vote. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Zadek. And we have 11 votes, Mr. Chair. Display the vote. And that's passed. Thank you. And uh, I would uh, uh, like to move the third and final reading on bylaw 19656, charter bylaw 19657, and charter bylaw 19658. Second. Please vote. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Zadek, and we have 11 votes, Mr. Chair. Please display the vote. And that has passed. Great. And uh, we will reconvene in 15 minutes. So, yeah, just uh, at 346.
Well, it is that time. It's actually a minute or two past that time, so I will call us back to order. Um, and I think I should probably start again with the roll call to make sure we're all back. So, um, so Councillor, uh, I'll just go in the order that you're showing up on my little screen here. Councillor Paquette? I am here. Councillor Knack? Good afternoon. Uh, <coughs> Councillor Essinger? Good afternoon. Be Councillor Hamilton next, I think. Good afternoon. Uh, Councillor McKean. Present. Uh, I'm realizing I never should have used this list, so it's going to be really confusing now. Councillor <laughs> Councillor Nickel. Present. Councillor Banga. I am back with a cup of masala tea. Uh, Councillor Cartmel. I'm here. Thanks. Councillor Katerina. Councillor Katerina had indicated that he wouldn't be back until four. Ah, okay, so we're missing Councillor Katerina. I'm not seeing Councillor Walters, so I'm guessing he hasn't been able to join us yet. And the mayor isn't back yet either, but I think we, so that brings us down to 10. So we're okay for quorum. Um, is there anybody I missed? Me. You missed oh, me. Sorry. Not a... I'm, using... I'm at the end of the alphabet. Yeah, <laughs> Councillor Zadok. Great, thanks. Sorry, my apologies. I'm, I'm going with a remarkably use, unuseful list on the, on the Google Hangout. Um, uh, great, thanks. So I think uh, we're mostly back, and um, we're now on to item uh, 3.17, no, 3.16, which is the multi-use unit housing in North Glenora. I think, uh, Councillor McKean, I don't think you needed a presentation. You really just had questions of the applicant or of administration. You have very good memory. I, I really, I think it's just of the applicant. Okay, then I think they're both on the line. I think there were two. Uh, which which of the two of them? It was Mr. Dunna or Mr. Durr? Uh, Mr. Dunna, I guess, as the proponent. Okay, then uh, away you go. Uh, Mr. Dunna, I just wanted to ask you, uh, in reading through the report, it says that you have plans for 45 units and yet only 15 parking spots. So I just wanted to hear your sort of business strategy around that. Uh, thank you for the question, Councillor McKean. Uh, so currently we have about 14 old townhomes on the site and there's a lot of excess parking that's not being used uh, by our tenants. We're actually giving the stalls away from free, for free even and there's not a lot of usage of them. So what we've determined anecdotally is about we're, we're roughly in that 40% usage now and maybe less sometimes. So we ran a study in uh, just after COVID hit last year in about April. And then we did another study a few months later. And these were during the peak times when uh, a lot of restrictions were in place. So we could have more of an indication of how many stalls are actually being used. And that's kind of what we've used to determine uh, we're not at zero stalls yet, but we do need some stalls, and we believe this is a good target uh, for the kind of the tenant mix and unit mix we have uh, planned for the site. So, yeah, because the only this ran, uh, I ran into this a little bit up in one of the other communities I represent with apartments and with us having to do restrictive parking or pay parking in the area. And I just wondered if you had contemplated that possibility down the road where um, the streets may not be, the, the public curb may not be free in the area. And so if you were sort of counting on that, you could run into some hardship down the road. Have you, have you contemplated that? Uh, uh, duly noted. And uh, I, I think we've, our studies have so far shown, and that's why this, this first block allows us to kind of test and, and develop the site and see if future phases, uh, if that's acceptable or future phases need more parking requirements and, and whatnot. So that's why I decided to go just with the one block as an RA7 at this time. Okay, that was really, that's what I really wanted to ask Mr. Duna, um, Mr. Chair, so. Thank you. I, I think you have to go, thanks Mr. Duna. I think you probably have to ask some things, but I'll be happy to move closure at the right moment. Absolutely. Are there any other questions for, for Mr. Duna? Are there any questions for administration? 
Actually, I should check and make sure there aren't any questions for Mr. Durr. Good. Then uh, any new information? Back to you, Councillor McKean. Yes, thanks, Mr. Chair. I will uh, move closure of item 316. I have a seconder. Second. Uh, closure has been moved. Please vote. And we're just missing Councillor Zadek. It's because I forgot yes. him in the, uh, it's his revenge for me having forgot him in the roll call. Thank you, Councillor Zadek. We have uh, 10 votes, Mr. Chair. And uh, display the vote. And that has passed. Um, I will move uh, first reading of item 316. Do we have a second here? Second. Um, anybody wishing to speak to it? Hearing none, please vote. And we have 10 votes. Perfect. And display the vote. And that has passed. I will move second reading on item 316. Second. Please vote. And we have 10 votes. The e scribe gods are with us. Uh, and that has passed. I will move consideration of third reading on the item. Second. Please vote. We have 10 votes, Mr. Chair. It must be the way that Councillor McKean's moving this, that it's coming across perfectly. Councilor, so with that, uh, that has passed. Back to you, Councillor McKean. Yes, I will move third reading on bylaw. Sure, I get this right. Charter bylaw 19660. Second. Please vote. Display the vote. And that has passed. Great, thank you. So that brings us on to item 3.17, uh, the Central McDougall item. I think we have a speaker in opposition for this, so we should get the presentation. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Perfect. Well, I can only speak for myself, so I assume everybody else can. Um, this application proposes to rezone a site in the Central McDougal neighborhood from DC2 site-specific development control provision to the CB2 general business zone and RE9 high-raise apartment zone. The proposed zones would allow for a 60-meter high or four-story commercial structure on the northern quarter of the site and up to a 69-meter high or 20-story residential structure on the southern three-quarters of the site. Next slide, please. The site is 1.47 hectares in size and is located in northern central McDougall along 105 Street. While the site does not have direct access to Kingsway, 105 Street is a cul-de-sac which serves a limited number of properties with a connection to the interior of the neighbourhood via 110th Avenue. This is the only access to the site as there is no public access to the east, west or south of the site. Directly north of the site is the existing Polish Hall. East across the LRT line is the Victoria School Field. To the west and south are existing townhouses and the Prince of Wales Armory, both of which do not have direct public access from the site. Next slide, please. The site is currently zoned DC21098, primarily to allow for non-accessory parking on a temporary basis with longer-term opportunities to develop the site as medium-density housing with community-oriented services. A development permit has been issued for the parking, which will expire in 2025. Because this application proposes standard zoning, there are no building details unlike the existing DC2 provision. Instead, each proposed zone offers a variety of development regulations that can be pursued by the landowner in a number of different scenarios. As a result, this application 
uh, this application reviewed the both the proposed CB2 and RA9 sites independently. Next slide, please. The proposed CB2 zone will allow for a wide range of commercial uses with the opportunity for residential uses above grade. The CB2 zone is intended to be applied to land that has good visibility and accessibility to major roadways. Additionally, the Main Street's overlay will also apply, which seeks to strengthen the pedestrian-oriented character of Edmonton's Main Street commercial areas and are located that are located in proximity to transit-oriented areas through visual interest. The proposed CB2 zone allows for a less intense building form as the maximum height decreases from 30 meters to 16 meters. This is suitable given its location along the northern portion of the site, as most of the impacts of the additional height will be felt by the adjacent sites to the north, which are not used for residential purposes. Though the existing DC2 provision does allow for limited commercial uses, the proposed CB2 zone will introduce a much wider range of commercial uses. Because of the relatively small area of this CB2, more intense commercial uses allowable by the CB2 zone will be precluded from developing at this location, such as warehouse sales or recycling depots. Overall, this is appropriate given the site's visibility and accessibility at Kingsway Avenue, the relatively small site size and minimal impacts on the adjacent properties. Next slide, please. The proposed RE9 zone introduces significantly more development intensity through this through its form, height, and density compared to the current DC2. The proximity to the Royal Alexandra LRT station and Kingsway Avenue supports high density at this location and generally makes the site an acceptable location for increased density. Impacts to adjacent properties are mitigated to the restrictions to the site access only being from 105th Street and being surrounded on three sides by non-residential zoning. While it should be generally understood that increases in density is access acceptable at this location, assessing the impacts of that development is difficult as the site size and regulations of the RE9 would allow the site to accommodate up to two high-rise towers with various site configurations. To properly assess the impacts of this application, a number of development options were reviewed. Next slide, please. Three scenarios were developed with the intent of reviewing the maximum potential impacts to the east and west of the site. At the top of this slide, a development concept with two towers located centrally on the site was completed to assess a reasonable middle ground for development. The two scenarios below locate the towers on the corners of the site to maximize the impacts on the neighboring properties. Under all circumstances, the impacts to neighboring properties are reasonable as they remain largely unaffected during the summer months. Even in a scenario where a tower is located on the southwest corner of the site, shadows on the interior of the neighborhood and even the adjacent townhouses are limited to the morning. It should be noted that while these are showing the development showing development which could occur under RA9, they show the worst case scenarios to assess the land use compatibility of the zone. Overall, the impacts of potential tower development on the site are reasonable and mitigated through the development regulations of the RA9 zone. Next slide, please. City plan identifies the site as being within a primary corridor adjacent to Queen Alexandra Hospital. Sorry, the Royal Alexandra Hospital. These corridors are understood to be wider and support a wide range of activities, which is supported by mixed use development. This application complies with and supports the objectives of the city plan. As the site falls within 400 meters of the Kingsway Royal Alex LRT station, the TOD, TOD guidelines apply, which identify the immediate area as an institutional station area. While there are no specific guidelines for these stations, the overall direction of these areas is to support and maintain the institutional functions of the area. The provision of increased density at this location will take advantage of the area's access to institutional services and public transit in general complies with the TOD guidelines. The Central McDougall ARP identifies the site for Polish Hall, Polish Cultural Center, Church and Seniors Housing. This application is in general conformance with this designation as these types of development can occur on the site under the proposed zones among other development scenarios. Next slide, please. In closing, administration recommends approval of this application. The proposal meets key objectives outlined in Edmonton's infill and growth framework and is generally compatible with surrounding development. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll take the chair back. Yeah, um, uh, before I pass it back though, we should, I should what, just want to recognize that uh, uh, Councillor Katarina has joined. So we should probably make note of that. Okay, welcome back. Um, Okay, so thank you for the presentation on 
that, uh, we have, just going to the right page here, we had um, presentations from the proponents, starting with Chelsea Jerzak from Situate Inc. Okay, good afternoon everybody, I'm ready to go. Um, hello again, uh, Mayor and members of Council. My name is Chelsea Jerzak from Situate and my presentation today will cover the highlights of the Polish Heritage Society's rezoning application for their site in Central McDougal. Uh, next slide, please. So the site, as you know, is located just south of the Polish Hall on Kingsway and west of the LRT tracks. Under city plan, the site's located in the major node of Blatchford Nate Kingsway, which supports mixed uses and mid and high rise building forms. The intention of this rezoning is to align with city plan intentions and to allow for a new standalone Polish cultural center to be built, uh, a structure that would not be allowed under the current direct control zone in place for the site. Uh, next slide. The vision for the site is twofold. The immediate intention is to build a new multi-use Polish cultural center to the south of the existing Polish hall with the effect of creating a unique community hub here. On the slide in front of you, you can see a rendering of the proposed new building, which has been designed by Gardner Architecture. Next slide. The southern portion of the site, which is to the right of the rendering that you see on the slide, is currently leased to Alberta Health Services for surface parking for their employees. When that lease expires in 2025, the vision is to redevelop the remainder of the site for multi-unit housing. The decision to apply for a rezoning to RA9 specifically is driven by city plan policy direction as well as the fact that regulations in the RA9 zone have been amended over the past few years to ensure high quality development. For example, because of the size of this site, uh, which is about one hectare, uh, the compre a comprehensive site plan would be required at the development permit stage. Uh, as well, the floor plate of any tower construction would be limited in size with clear separation distances between any towers. In addition, townhouse style units would be required on the ground level as well as amenity area requirements and bonuses for family friendly development. Next slide. Uh, this is a glimpse of some of the things that are going on behind the scenes of the project, uh, which are hopefully going to help make uh, the beautiful things that you saw on the previous slides come to life. Uh, in addition to the rezoning application before you here today, uh, the project team is also working hard behind the scenes and has submitted an application for subdivision uh, to support the rezoning, as well as an application for a development permit for the proposed new uh, cultural center. Myself and Ben Gardner, the architect, would be happy to answer any questions about those pieces of the puzzle. But I will summarize to say that there is a lot of work that is going into this project um, to get shovels hopefully in the ground this year. Next slide, please. Um, before I wrap up, I just want to acknowledge all of the awesome Edmonton businesses that are supporting this project. Uh, some, although not all, of which are listed on the slide here as well as give a shout out to the City of Edmonton staff from Planning Coordination, Subdivision and Development Services, Transportation, you name it, that have been working really hard with us uh, behind the scenes to bring this project to life. And uh, we really appreciate all of the hard work and dedication. Next slide. Uh, so with that, I'll wrap up my component of the presentation and say thank you and respectfully request your support on the rezoning here today. I'm happy to answer any questions or turn it over directly to the Heritage Society for their presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Zach. We'll pause here and uh, see if Councillor Essinger has questions. Or, or Councillor McKean. Well, was, oh, right, you selected this. Apologies. Um, yeah, the not. boundaries haven't changed. <laughs> Actually, not at no, all. This stays, uh, this stays. Anyway, go ahead, the, Councillor McKean. Apologies. Yeah, no, not at all. Ms. Uh, Jerzak. Uh, I don't think the cultural center, I could be wrong, but I don't think the cultural center is controversial. So the RA9 is going to be the, um, the where there'll be maybe some concerns. And so in, in looking at the report, there was, uh, <clears throat> I, suppose, I suppose the sun shadow would, be have, would have greater impact 
depending on where the towers were situated. Can you, right. you can you give offer any comfort on that for for residents and and representative city councilors? Yes, for sure. Well, there's a number of sort of regulations that are baked into the RA9 zone that I think um, add some comfort with regard to the configuration of the building, so the tower and the podium. So there are quite significant setbacks that would be required if any um, tower were to come forward, uh, as well as uh, restrictions in the size of the tower floor plate, which does allow a lot of light penetration um, as I think was demonstrated in the sun shadow studies. Uh, there are also requirements for amenity areas, ground level townhouse units, as I mentioned, but because the site um, is, is large, it's over 0 0.75 hectares, there's a comprehensive site plan that would be will be required at development permit stage. And so a lot of those details um, can be and will be worked out with regard to circulation, um, amenity, uh, and working you know, with administration to ensure that whatever goes in here will uh, make the best possible contribution to the neighborhood it is yeah it is the uh i suppose the one weakness of the standard zone is we can't see the renderings we can't exactly see what is planned but and remind me the uh, the floor plate is such that the sun shadow would kind of sweep along that um that multifamily or or row housing to the west yes it wouldn't, it wouldn't it wouldn't be a block of sun shadow for a lot of the day it's the the the, the tower is fairly narrow and would sweep the tower is narrow and would sweep so um, most of the impact is actually concentrated on the north and to the east and not on the west. It's very unlikely that the tower, any sort of tower would be placed along the west property line just because that's where the access comes in from 105th Street. Um, so the most likely scenario is that there would simply be an access roadway there, which would contribute to, the, to that buffer along the west property line. And as far as access, it's just 105th Street. But, it, right. but, I, but again, this would be, the assumption would be, uh, I don't have the proximity to the LRT station in front of me here, but it's, it's a pretty short walk. It, yeah, it is. Yeah, you would assume then that it wouldn't, you wouldn't be driving a lot of traffic onto that one roadway. That's correct. Um, we did, we did uh, do a traffic memo to support the uh, the application as well. So if there's any specific traffic related questions, um, we have Mark Huberman here that can answer those. Uh, but we we don't anticipate that parking or traffic circulation would be a huge issue here um, in the future. Well, I hope you're available for new information in case Mr. Champion has thought of something I haven't. So thank you. Thank you. I see no further questions for Ms. Jerzak at this moment. So we'll go to uh, Andy, I think it's Kubiski. Yeah. Great. Uh, well, yes. Um, hello, Your Worship and Honorable Council members. Um, my name is Andy Kubicki, and I am the president of the Polish Heritage Society of Edmonton. Uh, thank you for allowing me to tell you about who we are, where we come from, and what it is we want. I'll do a brief synopsis of uh, um, the presentation that I think all of you have received already from the city clerk. Uh, could I have slide number three, please? There, that one. Uh, that, that's a tremendous picture taken in 1960 at the Alberta College um, Gymnasium. And it's the last time that the celebration of the Polish uh, Constitution celebration of 1791 was held not in the Polish Hall. Ever since 1961 until this year, um, we've had it at the Polish Hall. The people you see in that picture are, they represent two waves of immigration to Edmonton by Polish people, uh, the pre-Second uh, World War people and the post-Second World War. And our society, it was founded in 1993 by the children and grandchildren of the people that you see there. That's, um, at that time in Edmonton, there was about 7,000 
Polish descendants living in the city. Uh, we, as a Polish Heritage Society of Edmonton, are a not-for-profit charitable organization whose mission is to unite the Polish community of Edmonton in a common cause by developing a center for the enjoyment and benefit of present and future generations of Edmontonians. Could I have slide number six, please? This is um, being shown before by Chelsea, but this is the north view of our proposed uh, Polonia Center, actually Center Polonia, I'm sorry. And in there will be housed many, many cultural things like a restaurant, a dance studio, schools for our children, Saturday school, etc. cetera. Uh, because today we have over 72,000 Polish descendants living in Edmonton. And this beautiful building designed by a very talented local architectural firm will highlight the attributes of the Polish community in Edmonton. It will exhibit Polish culture and traditions to non-Polish people. It will be a gathering place, tourist attraction and cultural panorama for all people. It will be a facility open to Polish and non-Polish community groups to use and enjoy. And that includes Central McDougall, by the way, for their uh, monthly meetings. We've already discussed that with them. And it will be a symbol of our gratitude to Edmonton for giving Polish people a really wonderful place to call home. So today we're asking for your approval to get the rezoning that we need for this particular site, the smaller parcel. I think it's CB2, and that'll allow the restaurant and the things that I've talked about. And the RA9, which will be developed as housing, but only after our Alberta Health Services commitment for the parking lease uh, uh, ceases to exist on February the 4th, 2025. So I thank you very much for your attention and your consideration. And that's all I have to say about that. Thank you. Uh, questions on that? Councillor McKean, did you have any questions on that? You know, I, I do want to ask questions, but I'm, I, I'm afraid, well, let me try them. Um, and, and you can rule me out of order, they may not be land use, but uh, could you uh, go through, sir, a few of the uses in the building? Because it seems to me there were things like a dance recital studio and that sort of thing that I thought were, were interesting. Well, you know, if I start on the main floor, there's going to be an authentic Polish restaurant, uh, the only one in Alberta, actually, that'll be pure Polish um, uh, menus and Polish traditional foods, etc. There'll also be a lounge. Also on the main floor, that's the main floor floor plan. There'll be a library, a gallery, a museum, an archive, and a little gift shop. And if we move to the second floor, we have a dance studio. We have five dance groups, um, uh, Polish uh, ethnic dance groups in Edmonton, from the little kids up to not as good as the Shumkas, but in my opinion, just as good as the Shumka Ukrainian dancers. But that, that's going to be their uh, dance studio where they can practice for the performances they make throughout Canada and even internationally from time to time. On the right-hand side is the classroom for Saturday morning school. We, right at this time, have about 108 children doing Saturday morning school. And the whole second floor on Saturday morning will be dedicated to classrooms for those children. There's also a games and hobby room in there. Like Polish people, there's many people who really like to play bridge. That'll be a place for them to have their uh, bridge playing place and uh, there's other games and hobbies that will be able to be done there. We have a children's play zone and we have teacher's office uh, and then have spare offices. And if we can move to the third floor, uh, that's for Polish organizations. We have over 20 Polish organizations in the city of Edmonton and there there'll be a boardroom that'll be available to any one of them on a booking basis, including uh, Central McDougall. There will be five offices in that office space, uh, which is four affiliates of the Polish Heritage Society and our society's offices. And there'll be archival storage locker rooms uh, just to the left of the atrium. Uh, this is to keep uh, all of the important records of our organizations away from garages and basements. 
and have them in a centralized location. Plus, there'll be, uh, you know, a mailing boxes there, et cetera, et cetera. So our Polish organizations will have a home of their own kind of thing instead of running out of, again, like I say, you know, their kitchen tables and other places. So that's about uh, it. And, of course, events. There'll be many events, but they won't be, like, we don't have capacity there for, like, uh, hundreds and hundreds of people. So our events will be, like, 60 to 100 type people, maybe 150 max, uh, that kind of thing. I hope that answers your question. Uh, uh, it, beautifully, yes. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. That's a lovely tour of, uh, of what is proposed. Thank you for that. Uh, I don't see any further questions. Uh, did any member of council have questions for Mr. Huberman or Mr. Gardner? I might try one of Mr. Huberman, if you don't mind. Sure, go ahead, uh, uh, Councillor McKean of Mr. Huberman, if you can unmute yourself. Mark, uh, I just want to ask you about if you could give us your thoughts on the RA9, uh, mm -hmm. one row in and out, mm -hmm. and, but the proximity to the LRT. From your, in your expert opinion, is it going to work? Or are we going to have traffic problems? Yeah. Thank you for that, Mr. Mayor, members, Council, Councilor McKean. Thank you for the question. Um, as uh, Chelsea, uh, Mr. Zek suggested, we did we did undertake to complete a traffic memo, and of course that was one of the key key points associated with the completion of the traffic memo. Um, the site, as I think we've talked about, is really in very close proximity not only to the um, LRT platform, but it's also very close to the Kingsway Transit Center. Both of those facilities are likely within about a four or five minute walk from the site. So to promote transit as a, a key mode of transportation, for not only the center Polonia, but also for the RA9 site, um, was important to us. Um, it's really been interesting looking at city traffic generation rates over the last number of years and how trip generation rates, traffic generation rates have changed, have modified, and in fact have been reduced. They've come down over time. And when you look at the RA9 site and when you look at the traffic or the trip generation characteristics of development on that site, and you actually compare it to the surface parking lot, which is about 300 strong in terms of the number of stalls that are currently there. And I will tell you that those stalls are actually well used. And although the temporal, the timing of the traffic activity is different um, in the sense that the parking lot, of course, generates all of its inbound traffic in the morning before the start of the day and generates most of its traffic leaving the site in the afternoon at the end of the day. And a residential development would actually flip that a little bit. Most of the traffic in the morning with the residential development will actually see traffic move out of the site. And most of that traffic will come back into the site at the end of the day. But in fact, the magnitude of traffic generated by the existing surface parking lot as compared to the magnitude of traffic activity that would be anticipated or projected by the RA9 site are virtually the same are virtually the same. So we're in fact taking traffic off the 105th Street corridor and we're actually bringing traffic onto the 105th Street corridor, but we're not adding to the traffic. We're just simply replacing that traffic. And so we felt comfortable, I certainly feel comfortable that it's a workable solution in terms of the RA9 site. Our report was clearly reviewed by transportation, my colleagues at transportation, and they found their way, they found their way clear to um, accept my conclusions and recommendations. So I think we were all comfortable, Councillor McKean, at the end of the day. I hope I've answered your question. Yeah, please. no, that was really good. You kind of forget about the existing um, traffic because of the parking. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, no further questions for Mr. Huberman this time, it looks like. Um, any questions for Mr. Gardner? 
Not seeing any, then we'll now hear from Warren Champion. Welcome. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, thanks for uh, the opportunity to speak to you. I've known Andy for a long period of time. I knew the prior president. And from the day they suggested what they wanted to do on the site, which was part of the working group, way back a long, long, long time ago, we supported the vision that they had. Uh, and I've talked to Andy a number of times and the density and height that you're proposing in the RA9, that's fine with us. Fine with the community league. It's fine with most of the people in the community. We don't have any arguments with any of that. I will just deal with the CB2 and we're not actually going to oppose the CB2, but if you think about the whole concept of node and density and all of those things, it would make a whole lot more sense if you took the Polish hall and you put it in as part of that, you took all the rest of that site that got cleared out there and you did underground parking and you really did a whole lot more density to the north. That's obviously not gonna happen, but in my view and the board's view, that's exactly what should happen we're not going to oppose that. When we get to the RA9 and when we get to where we have long been is that there was a commitment and it was a commitment that was made to the city of Edmonton that there was going to be seniors housing built by the Polish group a long, long time ago and that's always the way it has been. And so at the end of the day, the city was pretty enthusiastic about that. So was the community and so was the Polish group. So we have a real concern about these changes and it's not just the changes on this site. If you're going to create a sustainable community, and I've written that, and I hope you guys have had a little look at it. If you want to, if you want to create a sustainable community, you have to replicate that community. You have to get people out of their houses and into some other form once their children have left, whether it be reasonable condos or fake seniors. And at the end of the day, there's been far little far too few seniors projects built. And so that is a big deal. And when you look at 94% rentals in Central McDougal and about 88% multiple units, well, that's a big deal to us because everybody says they can't buy a house in Central McDougal because there's no houses left. <clears throat> so at the day, we were quite interested in modifying the caveat, unbeknownst to some of you. So we could in fact do infills throughout the whole community doubling the number of houses and we wanted them to have a place to go which would be onto the site and so at the end of the day it is really disappointing to hear an ra9 because an ra9 whether they modified the uh, zoning a bit etc it's a generic zoning and you can do literally anything you want in there we wanted to sit down and I have suggested numerous times that we do that type of height uh, there uh, when the cars are gone. So it's not a surprise. We have the expertise. One of our board members was a senior planner with the city of Edmonton. I got over eight, probably 8,000 hours. I have access to a number of architects. We have the ability to sit down and make good concrete partners with any future development there, but we can't do it when somebody has an RE9. So I'm suggesting, and I, and I mean, I, 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 there's no, nothing nefarious in this suggestion, nothing negative uh, at all, because I think, I, I think the Polish guys are doing a, a really good job as a cultural center, and we've talked about that. I just think that there's a bit of a waste of land, but I know that we could sit down and make suggestions, be satisfied that we were actually getting something. And you can incorporate towers, you can incorporate seniors and non-seniors into that development. And we are suspicious, none of that's gonna happen. Absolutely none of that is gonna happen. And it is, in our view, a big end run around why the city actually sold that property uh, under those conditions to the Polish group. And we've supported that and all of a sudden, uh, you know, the proverbial mats being pulled out from underneath us. So uh, it's, it's really troubling to have to sit there and say, 
everything that we supported for years and years and years and years, and we met over this for years and ARP, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's just all gone out the window. And frankly, I don't believe anybody, even though the developer seems to be a really pretty decent developer, that what we're going to get is anything remotely close to what we supported for years. And so... Can I get you to sum up there, Mr. Champion? Yeah. I'm not even sure. What have I got, about a minute? No, no, the five's gone by fast. Oh, okay, sorry. So we suggest that council not approve the second part of that, leave the DC-2 in place, let us meet, let us write a whole new DC-2, and get something that will satisfy everybody. And we think that we can satisfy the developer as well. Thank, thank you, Mr. Thanks. Champion. Questions for Mr. Champion? Councillor McKean? No, I thought it was really clear. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you. No other questions. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Champion. So we'll now pivot to questions of administration. Councillor McKean. Thank you very much. Um, and I think my, I, I just sort of asked Ms. Jerzak this earlier, but the, where the, where any tower or towers go on the site um, would have an impact on, uh, or you even have your own, in the report, it shows how towers on the western edge could have more impact. Um, does the DO then have um, the kind of authority to deal with that at the development permit stage? Well, as Ms. Jerzak noted, because of the site size, um, a comprehensive site design would be required at the development permit stage. Um, what's also important to note is the tower separation being a minimum of 20 meters, um, again, because of the site size, area nine, um, and then the floor plate not being able to exceed 850 meters squared um, above the height of a podium or 15 meters um, which is typical of what we would require in a site-specific zone in neighborhoods adjacent to downtown. So there's mid there's mitigation within the RA9 zone to limit that impact of shadowing and to ensure shadows move swiftly across impacted properties um, and allowing space for sun penetration as well. And what about, we heard a bit about uh, from Mr. Zach about potential townhouses. Remind me, please, are there requirements or is that just a potential uh, for, for this zone? Um, the RA9 zone has the requirement for at grade entrances, um, for ground level entrances, individual entrances that don't include um, sliding doors. Um, so, yeah, as um, Mr. Zach identified they could have townhouse style um, at grade. Right. Um, Mr. Uh, Champion mentioned seniors housing S and seniors in RA9 would not be incompatible, would they? No, they wouldn't be incompatible. So depending on what type of seniors housing um, he's speaking of, it would be uh, um, uh, Combination of multi-unit housing and supportive housing is one possibility. And rezoning to RE9 doesn't preclude the ability to do seniors housing. Um, and as mentioned in the report and in the presentation, the plan does identify the, the area for seniors housing. Um, but it, the zone definitely doesn't preclude that opportunity. And, and again, I know, uh, Ms. Mickelson, you mentioned the city plan. And this would fit uh, the city plan goals uh, quite appropriately, yes? Yes, it would. And, and just elaborate on that but a little bit again. Sure, <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Um, so um, not the Queen Alexander Hospital, <laughs> <laughs> the Royal Alexander Hospital, um, as well as... Um, Kingsway Avenue, um, sorry, I'm just pulling up my notes here. Um, it identifies this area as, um, this area is being influenced within the primary corridor of the Queen, the Royal Alex Hospital. Um, and the corridors are understood to be wider than a single block. 
um, and to support a wide range of activities which support the mixed use, um, which is supported by mixed use development. Um, so it is our opinion that this complies and supports the objectives of the city plan. Okay, uh, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, um, Councillor Henderson. Well, I just want to follow up a little bit more on, on, on the senior housing speech because I know part of the history, but not all of it. I do remember, I think it was actually part of my word still, um, when we very consciously, the current DC2 is very consciously zoned for seniors. Is it not? Correct. It's been rezoned a number of times yeah. in the last two have included zoning, but that has, that predated the practice uh, of basically ensuring that all types of housing were under one use class. So we no longer regulate for those uses. No, understood. Um, but it, you know, but it raises some, but it, you know, in terms of the intent and, and so if I heard, if I just heard correctly, the overarching plan for the area does anticipate it being for seniors as well. But will the, once we rezone it to RA9, will that have any, will that carry any weight? Through any uh, discretionary permit discussions, uh, the DO would look at the plan for those directions. Right. So if, what I mean is they want to use it for seniors, it would get the green light. But if they want to use it as straight RA9, it won't, it won't be, it, it won't come into effect. Yeah, not unless they're applying for a discretionary permit right. in the RA9. And you wouldn't need the, okay, so if, they, if, there was any dis, if there was any discretionary use, then the plan would kick in. But if it's all permitted uses, and the permitted uses in RA9 are pretty, are pretty broad. They would be as of right. They, yeah. As of right, and the plan would not come into effect. And I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I'm curious to know what, what the city's, you know, there was a reason, I think, probably for wanting the seniors piece to begin with. I don't know the history of, of, I think Mr. Champion was suggesting there was a land sale piece that went with that as well. Um, I, do we have any interest in that anymore? I mean, that's an interesting question. Uh, Mr. Champion may be able to uh, correct, but I don't believe this, the sale was between the city and uh, okay. yeah. the I don't, current that's landowner. Before my time, so, I assume yeah. it was the possibly the federal government with the armory that was uh, fair enough that makes sense yeah. There. yeah huh well it's, well, it's interesting because we don't and there's and we don't have anything in the city plan that speaks to this question of of or do we that would speak to the question of specific specific demand for seniors seniors housing and other than supporting uh, inclusive housing in all neighborhoods yeah. that support that life cycle, um, which obviously senior housing would be part of that. Um, it doesn't dive down specifically in setting any targets right. or any of that. So if we did want to, and I'm not suggesting we do or should, but if just to do a double check, the only way to maintain a commitment to seniors housing on that, would we would have to use something other than a standard zone. Correct. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you, Councillor Henderson. Any other questions for administration? Not seeing any, then I'll uh, check to see if there's any new information from uh, Ms. Jerzak. Sure. I may not be the best person to speak to some of the seniors' housing issues, but I'll, I'll start and then maybe Andy could, could join in. Uh, my understanding of the seniors housing situation is that um, there, that development was contingent on um, some funding that uh, fell through from the provincial government. So I think that there was some disappointment all around um, that that seniors housing component wasn't able to move forward. Um, and that happened some years ago with with regard to you know political decision making around around senior supportive housing uh, funding allocations, so since then the site has been uh, leased to Alberta Health Services to uh, raise some money to be able to redevelop the site, uh, which is you know hopefully going to be commencing soon. But that's a little bit of the backstory, and then looking forward now with city plan and the policy direction. We um, thought that this might be a good opportunity because the rezoning is required to accommodate the new hall or sorry, the new cultural center uh, that we could align the entire site with 
uh, with city plan policy. Thank you. Andy, Andy might want to add a little bit to that too. Sure, and we'll come to him in a moment, but just to see if there are any questions on Mr. Zach's new information. Okay, not hearing any. Uh, Mr. Kubiski. Uh, thank you. Um, one of our objects in our not-for-profit charitable society, um, which is a registered society with CRA for the charitable status, is that we provide safe and affordable housing for seniors. That was, it continues to be, and will become a reality once the south portion of this land is developed. In 2010, we had applied for an ASLE grant, which was going to cover operating costs for a pro, uh, their project, but we were not successful in that particular round of ASLE grants. Uh, that collapsed our financing and our project was canceled. Uh, we are still with the thought, not the thought, but the commitment to provide seniors housing. Now, we are about four years away from the parking that Alberta Health Services is using for some of their four and a half thousand employees at the Royal Alexandra Hospital. And when that expires is when the development of the South Portion will begin. Now, this development will be done by a bona fide local developer. And of course, developers are in the business to make some money. But uh, when the exploration over the last three, four years, what would be the highest and best use for this particular piece of land? Well, seniors housing is at the top of the list because, you know, you can walk to the hospital if you're sick. You don't have to wait for an ambulance. <laughs> I mean, we are right there. So it's just so obvious what will be here. But we're four years away. The Alberta Health Services is still under a lease agreement, which was approved by council last year for an additional five years to expire February 4, 2025. Now, all of us do not have a crystal ball about predicting the future, uh, but I can tell you this, that as long as we're the owners of this land, the best chance of there being seniors uh, housing is because we're the owners of that land. And that's about all I can say to that. Thank you. Uh, questions on that? Councillor Henderson? Well, I, and just to confirm then, because I'm, I'm still not sure, your intent then is to hold on to the land or the, your, your intent is ultimately to find somebody else to develop the land? That southern portion. Is it my turn to talk? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we intend to uh, remain as owners of the land and we intend to have an agreement with a developer who has the wherewithal to do a 60 or 70 million dollar project. Right. We're a charitable not-for-profit, meaning we are run by volunteers. Right, so you would do it in partnership with them, is your hope, and that you'll still have seniors housing out of that. I think with the location of this land in the city of Edmonton, our hope will be a reality because there's many people who are kind of desirous of doing something on this land. But as owners, we will have something to say what will be built on this land. Okay, that, so that's, that's still your intent and you will use the powers that you have in order to hope to try and make that intent happen then, is what I'm hearing you say, correct? Yes, that's exactly what, uh, what okay. we plan to do. Okay, yes. all right, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Kubiski on new information? Not seeing any. Um, Mr. Huberman? or Mr. Gardner, any new information? Not hearing any. Mr. Champion, under new information? Well, Andy's statement was really quite interesting, but I will correct another statement. There was a land swap a long time ago and the city ended up with this land. So the city sold the land for the existing developments and they also sold the land, the city, to the Polish group. And uh, when we looked at this, we agreed that we could do a true node here and a TOD that really should have been done. And you may have read what I wrote. I mean, I made those suggestions 15, 18 years ago, and it would have been a great TOD. It's not going to be that, but it can get, we can get something out of it, I guess. I don't see why we need to rezone the second part of this four years in advance 
when maybe we can sit down and work out an uh, arrangement with the developer that he, the developer will be perfectly happy with. We will give him whatever he needs. He will look at some of the ideas that we have, and we have access to some really smart architects and smart people, and maybe we can put a really good idea together. Why do we have to do this uh, in the RA9 portion today or two months from now? We have four years, and obviously we would like to be ready to go when the parking ends, but what the heck is the reason for doing it today? And we feel a whole lot like an end run is being done around us. And if there's no commitment in, on paper, we have no idea about seniors. And we can get as much density with seniors, as much as, uh, as they're going to get the way, uh, the way they're working, because we can combine uh, both parts of the population. And we can do a really good node. And I guess if we can't, then you can, two years from now, pass an RA9 or whatever the heck. Why do it today? What's the big hurry? There's no big hurry. And at least the community can feel part of this. Because I'm telling you, you're hearing from me, but I've heard from numerous people who all feel like they've been really short-circuited in this. So, I, you know, that's what I'm saying. What's the rush? Thank you, Mr. Champion. Any questions for Mr. Champion? Not seeing any. Then, um, unless there's need of any follow-up questions for administration, and I'm not seeing any, then I think closure of the public hearing would be next. Councillor McKean? I will move closure of the public hearing on 317. I'll second that. Um, Please vote on closure of the public hearing. We both voted. And we have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote, please. And that's carried. Mr. Mayor, I'll move first reading 316. Second. 17. Please, do you want to speak to it or? Yeah, I do, actually. Go ahead. Um, I, I, appreciate, um, <clears throat> I appreciate this application, and uh, I think we had two meetings uh, leading up to it, and I really appreciated those and getting to know the volunteer executive, um, Andy, at, at the Polish Hall, and hear about your pride and your plans and your history. And um, I think... First of all, the Polish community is a, just a, a marvelous, marvelous part of our city and has added um, so much color and vibrancy and wonderful food to, to the city. Um, but the, a couple other things during those meetings I asked, knowing that the Central McDougall Community League didn't have a hall, whether or not they'd be open to, with their new cultural center, if there'd be an opportunity maybe to see if they could um, host Central McDougall Community League, and I barely got the question out of the, out of my mouth, and they said yes, and I think those um, that offer has already been made. I think we heard that from Andy. The other thing I asked about um, about uh, the opportunities there was knowing that there was another uh, large wave of immigration into Central McDougall and how those folks can feel displaced and a bit lost. I said, would they, would they consider reaching out to the African community? And again, before that uh, question was barely out of my mouth, they said, absolutely. And there's been follow-up on that. And uh, I really appreciate that. I know that's not land use stuff, but I think the cultural center looks um, not only fitting, but really exciting. And I think it'll add a lot to Central McDougal and that part of the city. I'm really excited about that. And I think the RA9, from everything I've heard today, I'm quite comfortable that's an appropriate um, zoning and that seniors housing, if that is the wish uh, and the hope and the goal of, um, of the community at large, I think that that is something that the... Uh, 
The volunteer group also wants to see happen, and I think we heard that today. Um, but one of the reasons I brought up those two earlier questions I asked and whether or not they'd be willing to look at reaching out and working with us, I have no doubt in my mind that the uh, Polish community is absolutely willing to work with the Central McDougall Community League and talk about the community's aspirations and how they might fit with the um, Polish Community Center's aspirations. So uh, I want to say this was one of the nicest uh, development proposals I've had come before me, and the people were so fantastic, and the project looks amazing. So uh, I will uh, vote yes enthusiastically for this. And I heard Mr. Champion, but I'm confident that this group will continue to talk to the Central McDougall Community League and, and, it's, and also other members of the community so that they can fit in, as they always have, um, as, as a, a real asset for Central McDougall and the other communities, all communities in Edmonton. So uh, an enthusiastic yes for me, I hope others will, will do the same. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, um, Councillor McKean. Anyone else wishing to speak? Not seeing any, please vote on first reading. And we're just missing Councillor Zadig's vote. Yes. Thank you. We have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote, please. Mr. Mayor, I'll move second reading. Sorry. Uh, did it come up? It did, and okay. it carried unanimously. Okay, great. So that's carried. Uh, second reading. Thank you. That's moved. I'll second that. Please vote on second reading. And we have 12 votes. Display the vote. Carried. Mr. Mayor, I'll move consideration of third reading. 317. To allow third reading to proceed, please vote. I'll second that, by the way. And we have 12 votes. Display the vote, please. That's carried. Mr. Mayor, I will move third reading on Charter Bylaw 19675. I'll second that. Please vote on third and final reading. And we have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote, please. Carried. Um, Last but not least, we can certainly get started on it. We'll see how we're doing on time in a bit here, but the uh, uh, Garneau uh, and Strathcona item uh, 322 and 323 is next. Let's get the presentation on that. Hello again. This application proposes to rezone a site in the Strathcona neighborhood from RA7 low-rise apartment zone to RA8 medium-rise apartment zone. The proposed RA8 zone would allow for a 23-meter high, approximately six-story residential building with limited commercial opportunities at ground level. Next slide, please. This application was originally scheduled to be presented to Council at the public hearing on January 26, 2021, where it was referred back to administration to incorporate amendments to schedules within the Garneau ARP with appropriate engagement and return to a future City Council public hearing. 
Following this motion, an engaged Edmonton website was hosted from February 15th to March 1st to collect feedback on the proposal. Comments provided from the public on this proposal were mixed. However, a common theme heard from residents was that the proposal was not consistent with the ARP nor in character with the Garneau neighborhood. Next slide, please. The site consists of three lots located mid-block on 106 A Street, north, northern of 85 Avenue. While this site is formally located within the Strathcona neighborhood, it is governed by the Garneau Area Redevelopment Plan. The surrounding area is predominantly zoned the RA7 zone, which is for the development of low-rise apartments of up to four stories in height. Residential towers are located a block to the north on Saskatchewan Drive, either zoned RA9 or through site-specific development control provisions. Nearby park amenities include access to the River Valley from both Saskatchewan Drive and 106 A Street. A new park scheduled for development as part of neighborhood renewal is located on 107th Street with the existing EL Hill Park and Strathcona Rail Community Garden across 106th Street to the east. Next slide, please. The existing RA7 zone and the proposed RA8 zone are similar with differences in height, floor area ratio, and minimum density. Permitted and discretionary uses, including commercial ones, are the same, as are most other regulations like setbacks, stepbacks, and design details. The land use change being considered with this application relates to the addition of approximately two more stories. Directly adjacent to the property are two existing low-rise apartment buildings with a modern four-story building to the north and a three-story walk-up to the south. Transitions and to and from these properties are managed through setbacks and a step back above the third story, which is comparable to the heights of these adjacent buildings. It is concluded that the additional height, while creating slightly longer shadows, is not a significant change in scale or building form and will result in noticeably and will not result in noticeably different land use impacts on surrounding properties. Next slide, please. The Garneau Area Redevelopment Plan is intended to accommodate growth through redevelopment while ensuring it is compatible with the existing residential character of the neighborhood. The general policies of the ARP manage this growth by restricting high-rise development to the north and east edges of the neighborhood and managing an appropriate transition from high-rise to low-rise buildings. This is reflected through policy G4, which graphically shows the intended tra transition in height on the right side of the slide. Next slide, please. The site is located within sub area two of the Garneau ARP. While the plan describes this area as appropriate for medium density development and encourages diversity in housing, the policies which govern this sub area restrict development to four story apartments or stacked row housing. The RA7 low rise apartment zone is applied to the majority of the properties within sub area two. This is demonstrative of more modest definition of medium density development when the Garneau ARP was written compared to current expectations of medium density. While this application does not propose to amend policy 2.1, sorry, does propose to amend policy 2.1 to allow for six story development, it is important to note that the general residential policies of the ARP would still be maintained. The site is located approximately 40 meters from the rail right of way, which is a break between high rise buildings located on Saskatchewan Drive and the interior of the neighborhood, which allows for development of low rise apartments. Allowing a six story development on this site would meet the land use objectives of sub area two, as well as be in alignment with the general policies of the Garneau ARP. In addition to this, in addition to this, amendments in addition to these amendments, the sub area two detailed land use map and neighborhood wide land use maps within the ARP will be amended to show the change in zoning. Next slide, please. With regard to the residential infill guidelines, the site does not align well with its locational criteria. Administration recognizes the locational criteria for mid rise apartments. And the residential infill guide guidelines is likely too restrictive, especially in an area which is comprised of low rise residential development. Aside from locational criteria, the R8 zone aligns with the guidelines for parking, built form design, site design, and streetscape. Within the city plan, the University Garneau area is identified as one of six major nodes located across the city. While there are no specific boundaries identified for these major nodes, they are considered to be approximately two kilometers across. Located 1.3 kilometers from the University of Alberta campus, this site is within very close proximity to this node. The increase in density proposed with this rezoning aligns with the goals of the Edmonton City Plan. Next slide, please. 
In closing, administration recommends approval of this application. The proposal meets key objectives outlined in Edmonton's infill and growth framework. The additional height is appropriate for its location within the within the neighborhood and will sorry, will result will not result in noticeably different land use impacts on surrounding properties. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me get back to my speakers list on this one. We will now hear from Michael DeWolf from L7 Architecture, Inc. on behalf of the proponents. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, councillors. Uh, my name is Michael DeWolf from L7 Architecture, and I'm here to present our supporting information for the rezoning application. Uh, as you can see on the first slide, we have a little image of our proposed um, development. Uh, next slide, please. So the site is currently RA7, as you've heard, and it contains three end-of-life dwellings. Uh, the site is adjacent to a modern four-story apartment to the north and a three-story walk-up to the south. Surface parking for this site and uh, all of the neighbors' properties is accessed from the rear lane. Uh, the next slide, please. The proposal is to rezone in support of our residential apartment from RA7 to RE8. Uh, this supports our requirement for a height increase and an increase to the FAR. Uh, we aim to develop a compact and sensitive residential apartment uh, with close proximity to the major node. The proposal is in general alignment with the Gono Area Redevelopment Plan and supports the city infill and density objectives. Uh, two years ago, this developer saw an opportunity to add to the local community housing and met with the city to discuss the CMHC Affordable Housing Grant. The project overall aims to have very little impact on the neighborhood. Next slide, please. Um, as you can see, the proposed changes for the site zoning are summarized here. The top right illustration uh, shows the maximum bylaw parameters that will be created uh, by the zoning, and our project will be within these parameters. The surrounding sites are RA7, and we need a modest increase uh, to the mass, density, and height from RA7 to create a financially viable project. The transition of the height is created through the stepbacks and the setbacks, and we are um, creating an underground parkade with rear lane access to reduce the overall impact of parking on the site. We are creating much needed housing near the University of Alberta, and our proposal includes ground level street entrances, uh, an increase in the pedestrian friendly streetscape, and use, utilizes the existing boulevard trees and landscape to create a buffer zone to the houses opposite on the opposite side of the street to minimize the impact of the height. Overall, the project will also safely engage the neighborhood with its CPTED. Uh, next slide, please. Alignments, uh, our overall uh, project aligns with the city plans and will blend into the existing neighborhood character. We are looking to accommodate the city growth plans, of the ARP, and we follow the residential infill guidelines to increase density. As we said before, we are located in a key activity area near White Avenue and the University of Alberta. And we are looking to the city plan to accommodate the future growth uh, with the residential infill focusing on these key nodes. As uh, Holly said before, the Ghana U of A area is one of six major key node areas and White Avenue is identified as a primary corridor close by. Next slide. Uh, so the solar study uh, that we put up here uh, just shows that the proposal will not impact the neighbors more than the existing mature trees in, in the street there. Uh, the trees are highlighted in green. So the reasons for rezoning are outlined below. Um, and we are again putting together an appropriate development that is financially sustainable and meets the objective of these city plans. Our design is ready and we spit it for a development permit as soon as possible. Next slide, please. Uh, we undertook a community engagement through the City of Edmonton website, as Holly discussed earlier, and we also spoke directly with the Garneau Community League. We have discussed all of their concerns that were raised, and uh, we've gone through these. There is much support for the development from the local community, as we're providing affordable housing for family and students so that they can enjoy the Garneau area. During this presentation, we have addressed the, major, uh, the majority of the public concerns with regard to height, trees, shadows, and parking. 
Uh, we want to be very clear that there is no commercial um, space proposed in the in the proposed development, but also that the RA7 would also allow that anyway. And we are creating a mix of family and student accommodation. Uh, we'll be improving the local facilities by adding on-site bicycle storage and a rideshare parking stall. And we're building a long-term future for the site that supports the keynote for the university area. Next slide. Thank you all for your time. If you have any comments or questions, uh, my contact details are also at the bottom there if anyone is interested. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Thank you. Uh, questions, I'll start with Councillor Henderson. Well, one of, I guess, the essential question, because I, you know, knowing some of the comments that I suspect will be coming up next, is concerns for what this does to the, to the plan. Um, and I, so I'm really puzzled, I have to confess, why an RA7 is not financially viable in this area. Is it because of the underground parking? Uh, yes, it would be the, primarily due to the underground parking. So, so, the, so the trade-off is you can put your parking underground um, and that's why you need the extra height? That's correct. Um, so if you did an RA7, because I, I can't remember if this was one of the areas that used to be under the old, well, it wasn't that old, we only got rid of it a year ago, the, 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 the medium density overlay or the, well, there were two of them. And if it was, that would already have given you an extra floor from what it would have been a year ago. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm, just, I'm just really trying to think, because I think this is the question of whether or not because you're not the only RE8 application that's going to come forward in this, you know, in a small block area, they're um, very similar. So I'm just trying to explore what's pushing that and why why the RE7 doesn't work. Because there's a lot of there are are, are there are other are RE8 opportunities in the plan. Um, this was areas that was very specifically put aside for RE7. So um, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, it might be more appropriate for my uh, colleague Jason to sure. answer that oh, question. Sure I don't know whether okay. yep. right no, now or or later. No, I, I I can I can ask ask it of them because I, I just I know yeah, I'm just anticipating the discussion we're going to have later, so I wanted to give you guys a chance mm -hmm. to respond. Great, thanks. Thank you. Any Thank other you. any other questions for Mr. DeWolf? Not seeing any. Then next up uh, is Jason Barclay, um, uh, whose questions only. So I'll go to so, Councillor Henderson. So I think for that you've question. heard my question. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I'm I'm here with uh, Michael in the same in the same room. So um, the the development works uh, price per door, um, and the the um, the the amount or the the sale of the three lots uh, takes it out of a uh, area where you can't afford to uh, do the RA7, and we also were sensitive to wanting to put the uh, the parking underneath. So we could we could do an RA7 that would wouldn't allow uh, uh, we didn't need any parking, and we were sensitive to that area. So we really wanted to uh, satisfy um, the performa and also. They required. We didn't want to have a zero parking in the uh, on the lot, and so we had a. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we were sensitive to uh, the impact of parking and uh, uh, and being able to meet the performa. It, it wouldn't have worked. Uh, the RA7 uh, would have allowed us, or would have made us have no parking on the site. Um, I know one of the questions is going to be coming up. In a minute, though, is going to be concerns because it is a it is a kind of dead end street. It it dead ends it up at a lane. Um, uh, that there are going to be questions that come up around traffic generation. So understanding that RA8, you can put in no parking if you want under the open parking. But what are your intentions currently in your thinking um, for how much parking you're going to put in? We're we're uh, we're at 27 stalls. Okay. With with the underground. Okay. Great. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any qu other questions for Mr. Barclay? Not seeing any, then we will now hear from those in opposition, starting with Kyle Remfer. Hi there. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, 
So hi to city council. Um, I live in the four story building um, right next door. I am in a corner ground unit that is literally uh, like right next to the site. So I'd be one of the ones who would be most, um, I guess, impacted by any potential redevelopment of this site. Um, I going to try and obviously keep this up, keep this within my time. Um, I just want to speak today to why I don't think this proposal is the uh, right one for this area. Um, that's there's been some comments already brought up as to as to the concerns. Um, I don't think that the proposed rezoning that would allow for this type of increase in density on this street, which is pretty much a, a one way dead end street makes any sense to be quite honest. Um, with, the, with the type of, of traffic that, and the noise pollution that would be generated from this, I, I just don't think it is, I, that, sorry, I just don't think that it's worth it at the end of the day. Um, I also believe that there's been, uh, that the city has aired in it, like administration has aired in its report using its uh, proximity to the University of Alberta as a reason to approve of it, just based on their own guidelines. Um, the distance from here to the, the east side of the university campus is, it, is, is about 1.8 kilometers, as is my understanding. Um, I, walk, I, walk this, I walk straight across 85th Avenue to the university campus uh, at least four times a week uh, when I'm catching the train to go downtown to, to go to my office. Um, and it's a good it's a good twenty minute walk, and I'm not someone who's a slow walker. i I've, I've always been more of a quick walker. Um, just also believe that the potential rezoning for a building of this height and density, along with the potential for the rooftop atrium and patio, um, i I think would lead to cut at least with where my unit is, I think would end up casting a long shadow in terms of um, just in terms of the sunlight that I get into my unit and that others would likely get themselves. Um, I also think that the potential for the atrium in terms of any kind of noise, um, especially during the summer in a street that the, this quiet is, does, po does pose potential problems as well. Um, and and that's that's to say, like I work for I work for another architecture firm as well. I'm not against obviously I'm not against these developments, but for me the proposal has to make sense, um, and I don't think that this particular proposal makes sense as well. I mean I'm 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 just a renter. I'm not somebody who will ever likely um, be able to afford a mortgage myself. Um, I just I oppose this because I think this would. Uh, change the character of the neighborhood detrimentally um, and I think it would change what I love about being in this area I just like I said before I don't think that this particular proposal makes any sense for this for this street um, of course everyone has their own reasons whether they support it or not um, I know obviously I would also note that there was more in terms of the public engagement there was more comments that were opposed to this proposal uh, than supporting it and I hope that City Council will end up voting no on rezoning and that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Questions on that? Councillor Henderson, go ahead. Yeah, just to explore a little bit with you because I mean part of part of what we're the reality is they could be building in a building just like yours without even coming here. Um, already as of right. Um, so I guess the real question for us is what the differences are from your perspective being next door. Um, I, I'm guessing that those the shadow issues, the sunlight issues, um, I'm guessing even to, you know, that the, the increase in density, what you already have, um, would be relatively similar um, from what they already have. So what, what are the differences in your mind? I just I think with the with with what I saw just on the presentation, just with the number of, just with the number of units itself, I think would put a lot more pressure in terms of density in this particular part of Garneau myself. And I just I think it would create um, it, the and like you said before with the with the concerns with the potential for the the street traffic, the noise and and things of that nature. I mean, I could be totally wrong. I'm no, just, I'm not. I mean, you, but you're, my point is you're going to get that with the RA7 any, to, to a certain extent anyway. So I'm trying to understand what, what this would do that the RA7, which they can already do as of right, um, would create for you. It, uh, for, uh, 
for me, I mean, it's with it's it, for me, it's it's the increase of density, increase of height, and the and the total number of units. I mean, this is a so sixteen the, unit building. Of, it's the percentage increase in numbers of people for you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Mr. Remfer? Not seeing any. Next up, then, is Gary Nash. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, city and members of council, the property proposed for rezoning is subject to the Garneau Area Redevelopment Plan. Uh, policy G4 of that plan states it is the policy of council that the new development must not affect an abrupt change in height between adjacent land use districts of different densities. The summary of action states this administration and council will, I emphasize will, have regard to this policy when reviewing development application and or redistricting uh, applications. City planning has essentially dismissed all of the negative responses to the rezoning by stating three reasons in the support of the development. However, the conclusions arrived at uh, uh, in their report by city planning are false. Point number one is not a moderate increase in building mass. Increasing the height of the building from four stories to six stories is a 50% increase. That severely contradicts policy G4 of the Garneau ARP. Point number two of the city planning does not respect the height transition required by G4 of the Garneau ARP. An abrupt seven meter height difference on the north side and 10 meters on the south side of the development will be caused by the rezoning. Uh, the sketch below in the material that was presented uh, to council um, is scaled vertically and it shows the rear view of the proposed development looking west and is taken explicitly from the sketch from the Garneau ARP as noted on page 60 or 360 of the administration report. So you can clearly see that it is quite a, it, it's not a smooth transition. It clearly violates the Garneau ARP. The third point of the city is incorrect by stating that the subject property is near the U of A. As pointed out by Mr. Kempfer, in fact, the property is 650 meters east and 150 meters south of the closest easterly boundary of the U of A campus. The word near would be properly understood to be, say, within 100 meters of the U of A, not eight times that by an accessible route or a road of a sidewalk. City planning recognizes that the proposed site does not fit well with the residential infill guidelines. It admits on page 361 of its report, the site does not align well with this locational criteria, except for its proximity to the University of Alberta. 1.8 kilometers is certainly not in close proximity. On page 362 of the administration report, city planning states that from the public engagement and session, there were 26 negative responses, and 20 responses supporting the development. However, all comments in favor of the rezoning are actually addressed by the changes in the current RA7 zoning requirements relative to those prior to 2019. A critical fact regarding dwelling density has not been explained by city planning in its, admin excuse me, in its administration report. In 2019, the city of Edmonton bylaw 12,800 was amended with respect to RA7 and RA8 zonings um, requirements with Charter Bylaw 18967 passed in August of 2019. There are no longer minimum dwellings per hectare requirements with Charter Bylaw um, in either RA7 or in RA8. Rather, the number of sites is determined from the floor area uh, limits based on the lot areas of the development. Since the goal of the City of Edmonton, the way we grow bylaw 15100, 
is to increase the density of infill developments. The new requirements in the existing RA7 zoning of the subject site with a floor area of 2.3 would allow 41 bedroom suites or 36 two bedroom suites to be constructed. If the 2.5 ratio was used, a mix of suites consisting of one and two bedrooms and four three bedrooms for a total of 40 suites could be constructed. The RA7 zoning previous to 2019 would allow 15 suites with the possibility of an additional bachelor suite with the approval of the subdivision and uh, development appeal board. So the difference is a 250% increase in the allowed density over the previous density of RA7 allowed with by law 12,800. So now it's clear that the existing new or current RA7 zoning allows for a substantial increase in dwelling density, which more than adequately satisfies the way we grow. There's absolutely no need to change the zoning to RA8. Moreover, it must be stressed that the RA7 zoning no longer has parking requirements set by the city. Rather, in accordance with Charter Bylaw 19275, effective in July of last year, the developer sets the parking requirements for a given site in its submission for a development or building permit. The city has advanced this policy to allow for greater density and larger suite sizes and mixes. I'm sorry, Mr. However, Mr. developers Nash. will look for the maximum cost benefit from Mr. the criteria, Nash. and there is a distinct possibility that the Mr. lack Nash. of site parking will prevail. We're we're past the five minutes at this point. Can I get you to sum up, please? Um, bottom line is the existing RA7 zoning is more than adequate to satisfy the, the, the city plan. And uh, the comment from the developer on the fact that from what he said, RA7 was not financially viable to, con to construct his building. I'm afraid that is absolutely wrong and it's simply their perception of how to maximize you, Mr. Nash. Uh, the value from the site. Thank you, Mr. Nash. Questions for Mr. Nash? Councillor Henderson, um, go just, ahead. Just quickly to ask the same question, because I, I understand all the planning stuff. I understand what's in the GARP. Um, I, you know, the, my question is, in this particular case, on this particular spot, because I think it's what we're being challenged to, to look at today, what the implications are of the difference in really adding those two extra floors. And, and I suppose the, the, the extra density as it was raised by the last speaker. What you think the concerns are? Well, the concern is the, part, is the lack of parking. Um, the building that we have has 16 suites. We have 19 parking stalls and they're generally full. Okay. Now this new development is, is uh, basically bragging about 27 stalls but they got 60 suites, for goodness sakes. So it just doesn't work. In interestingly, so, I'll, I'll just go back and ask the same question, though. If it was RA7, they would maybe put in exactly the same number that you have in your building with no parking spots. And, and they could do that right now without asking for rezoning. They could do that as of right. That, that's, that's absolutely true. Yeah. But you said the same size of my building. I only have 16 suites under the new RA7 yeah, I, I, zoning. I don't know which building you're in. I was assuming you were in the four-story next door. Um, I am in oh, a four-story okay. next okay. door. Okay. It has 16 suites. Okay. Right. They can build 40 with RA7 next door. Yeah, and I, and I don't know how many they, I don't know what their intention is on the number of suites, so. Um, their, yeah. Excuse me, sir, the, uh, their plan is 63 suites. Uh, I think they've, They've stated that in their proposal. Yeah, and, and the zoning doesn't... Speak. I just interrupt, that's no, no, irrelevant, no, 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 and it's no, not accurate. Everybody stop, please. You can come back we're, with new information. We're, yeah, one okay, of I just, wanted, I just wanted to get a sense of, of what, what the concerns were. Great, thank you very much. So just to be crystal clear again, it's one speaker at a time, and they're the only opportunity for reply to prevent crosstalk is under new information. So we will have an opportunity uh, to hear again from the proponents. Uh, once we've heard from 
those in opposition and ask questions of administration. Now, uh, we do have time, I think, for one more speaker before we hit the uh, 5.30 break, which I understand um, uh, councillors uh, have a number of things booked over that break, so I think we will take that break and then resume at 7.30 in accordance with the the, the normal scheduled rules, unless seven. there is a motion to change that. Sorry, seven, apologies, seven. Um, uh, so, but you can think about that. Um, well, we hear from our next speaker, who is Cal Lang from Ace Lang Homes. Go ahead, Mr. Lang. Hi, Mr. Mayor and Councilman. <clears throat> Just follow the rules. As the owner of the two and a half story, 17 suite apartment located immediately south of the, the site under discussion, we are strongly opposed to the proposed zoning change. Our family company, Ace Land Construction, built this apartment in 1980 and have owned it ever since. When we built this apartment, we found out what size the building could be, found out how tall the building could be, and found out how many parking spots must, must be included in the size project. Not once did we ask for a variance or a zoning change. We followed the rules. Our apartment is two and a half stories high and is 7.5 meters, 25 feet tall. The existing RF7 allows a height of 16 meters, 52 feet, and, and would be much higher than our apartment. The allowable zoning for RA7 already allows for the building to be constructed to be twice as tall as our apartment. Ace Land Construction is okay with this, as these are the new rules. Should the zoning change to RA8, then the height of the building could go up to 23 meters, 75 feet, which would make it 16.5 uh, meters, 54 feet taller than our apartment. In the Garno ARP, it says that it is a policy of the council that new, develop must, new development must not effect an abrupt change in height between the adjacent land use districts of different densities. 54 feet taller than the neighboring apartment is an abrupt change. Just follow the rules. Let's just say that there's an average of one and a half people living in each apartment suite in the, in the area. In our apartment, we, we, would, we have 17 suites, and so there's about 25 to 26 people residing in our building. Did I mention to you that our site is the same size as the proposed site? We have 22 parking spots. Under the existing RF7 zoning, a four-story, 40-unit apartment building would have, would have about 60 people living in the building. Under the requested RA8 zoning, the building could have 60 units and up to 90 people living there. With existing parking rules not required, but the developer has indicated that for the 90 people, he would be happy to include 23 parking spots. Whoopee. The par neighborhood has limited parking at present. Can you imagine the chaos if 90 people living in the building each had a car and then invited friends over? Just follow the rules. There are, there are existing high-rise units on Saskatchewan Drive located one block to the north and on White Avenue located four blocks to the south. There are no other high-rise developments between the two streets. Why? Because people built their homes and their apartments in with the rules of the day. If this development is approved, it would stick out like a sore thumb and I have uh, I will have a very negative and will have a very negative impact to this community and our property. Just follow the rules. We employ our city representatives to make the rules, and you have done a good job with the Garno Area Redevelopment Plan and the Mature Neighborhood Overlay. Other developments have taken place in this community in the last few years, with beautiful four-story buildings constructed under the rules of the RA7 guideline. Why should you deviate now? Just follow the rules. Thank you, Mr. Lang. Questions on that, Councillor yeah, Henderson? Yeah, just to, you know, to be consistent, uh, because I hear, I hear you saying that there's an abrupt change of height between your building and the one next door. Ironically, you could probably build yours, as you noted, taller now. Yes. Um, but I'm wondering what, what, what is the, that, 
that abrupt change of height, what effect does that have on your building? Well, it, uh, it's just that it will look out of place. One building is high, our building is low. There, on this street, there are four, uh, three existing apartment buildings. And then there's these three little houses in the mill. There's a three. There's a three-story apartment. There's a four-story apartment, and my apartment, which is a, a two and a half-story apartment. And so now, all of a sudden, you've got a six-story, three, four, two and a half, six. Well, just just, just to play devil's advocate a little bit. So the difference in height would be the same abrupt change as we have from the four-story building to the single families that are there right now. And, I, and how, how does that affect the, how does that affect you? I'm really just looking for the effect upon you here. I understand, you know, I understand the rules, all of those kind of things. I understand you have concerns about the numbers of people and the yeah. and the vehicles. It's the height piece I'm just trying to explore um, about what the, what difference that makes uh, for you. Well, um, not as much as the uh, because we're on the south side and the sun comes from the south. It will not have as much impact as Mr. Nash's building yeah, on the sure. north side. Yeah. Uh, but um, I think the big thing is increase in height means increase in density. Going from, like I said, uh, from uh, RF7, you could have, let's say, 60 people living in that building so, with zero parking. RH, you can have 90 people living in that building. Yeah. With and, zero parking. And so, and just to explore a little bit, so your concern about the number of people has to do with the parking and not with the number of people per se, right? Am I yes, correctly? basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great, but thanks. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Lang? Not seeing any. Then again, just to check in, the default is 90 minute dinner break. Um, I know some folks had some things uh, at 5.30. So we've sometimes shortened that break, but um, uh, I'm not hearing a motion to do so. We would, by default, be back at 7. Right. So, Councillor Henderson? Well, I would just, I would, I'm, I under, understand that, ah, uh, okay, Councillor Academy has a 6.30 commitment, so we okay. need to go to 7. Okay. okay. Understood. All right, okay. so folks have booked over the break, which is entirely within their rights, so we'll, uh, um, We'll come back at 7 sharp to carry on with uh, Megan Rich, who will be our next speaker at that time. So see you in 90 minutes. Thank you. We're in recess until then.
We'll roll call in uh, 30 seconds or so. Stand by. Okay, good afternoon, uh, or evening, I suppose. Um, I will uh, roll call this time, starting with Councillor Knack. Good evening. Good evening, Councillor McKean. Good evening. Good evening, Councillor Nichol. Good evening. Good evening, Councillor Paquette. Good evening. Good evening, and Councillor Walters. Okay, yeah, he had let me know he was uh, indisposed feeling a little under the weather today. So um, uh, so hopefully he'll feel better by tomorrow. Uh, Councillor Banga. Hello, back at my post and uh, after a good walk. Nice. Councillor Carmel. Yeah, that's everything. Councillor yeah. Carmel. He had indicated that he was running a little bit behind. Okay. All right. Councillor Katarina. Yes, good evening. Evening, Councillor Zadek. Good evening. Good evening, Councillor Esslinger. Good evening. Good evening, Councillor Hamilton. Good evening. Welcome. And uh, Councillor Henderson is just, oh, he made it. He was rendering assistance to a citizen who needed some help. So, uh, well done. Um, okay, so. Uh, We've got 11, which is plenty to resume. Uh, so I'll just double check that uh, our remaining three speakers are all with us. Megan Rich, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you. Welcome back. Uh, stand by. We'll come to you in a moment. Uh, Fred Hurdley. Uh, yes, I am. Okay, thank you. And Michael Flanagan. Yes, I'm here. Super. Okay. Um, Megan, the floor is yours for the next five minutes. Welcome. Thank you. Um, the Garnet Community League opposes the rezoning because we think the GARP and the city plan meets with the current zone that it already has. Um, we feel that the height might be excessive for this particular site. Um, now this might not speak directly to this particular development, but it does apply to this development in that the community engagement was offered by the city and the architects. However, it was basically just telling us what we were going to have. There was no actual discussion or tit for tat or anything like we've had with previous developers in the past. Um, this has been, I guess, the new standard, so I'm not sure if things have changed for how things were held before, but we weren't approached by the developer at all. We were approached by the architect after it was sent back last time, back in January, I believe. Um, but anything that we would bring up would be told a no because CMHC had already approved the development. So there was no community input to this building whatsoever. Um, we think the community should have been consulted first before CMHC approval. Um, there's a couple of things um, that I, we do appreciate the rooftop terrace being on this, not being put on the south side of the building rather than the north side of the building, even though the north side has a much better view but it might allow for some sun to peek through and maybe melt the snow by July on the houses across the street, we're hoping. Um, and I don't really have a whole much to say because everybody else has pretty well covered it and I'm sure Mike will be coming up with a lot more. Um, but I did want to just address one thing that Mr. Remfer said and he said he's not, he's just a renter and I just want to stress that in the Garneau Community League especially, they're so vibrant to our community and we need them to help us advocate for the community. And we hope that they stay long-term, whether they stay renters or whether they purchase, but we do value them all the way. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? 
Councillor Henderson, go ahead. Yeah, just because I, I think you're probably in the best position to sort of speak to the importance of the plan and the history of the plan and what this, you know, if, the concerns around that angle. Um, I think that the, the Garneau ARP actually fits the city plan already. Um, I think the problem being is that the lots that were for higher developments were bought up years ago and not developed. So people want to build prof and we it's profitable buildings in neighborhoods. Um, but they're now grasping at little pieces of land that they can find wherever just to plunk something in to build something. So I just find that the GARP actually, if you look at it, fits actually very well within the city plan, the new city plan as well, so. Yeah, and there's, there's been quite a bit of redevelopment under the GARP. Are you, because I'm, I'm just trying to think, you know, this is on that, that cusp between uh, Strathcona and, and Garno, but um, there are still quite a few RA8 opportunities in, in both, are there not? Um, I really am too busy with our neighborhood to worry too much about, about Strathcona. Strathcona. Yeah, yeah, although yeah. I do feel for them too don't worry yeah. but there are so many zones that could be the thing is I think the problem is that the land is more expensive right so right. The people developers and we don't know who this developer is we've only spoken with architects so I don't know what they're thinking is no, and I, you know, and, and I, you know, in retrospect, I mean, I think that was one of the advantages of us having to send this back because of a mapping piece. It actually wasn't for this purpose, but it, I know at that point, that's why I, I knew that conversation hadn't taken place, which is why I encouraged them to get in touch with you. And I gather that happened, yeah? But at that the point, yeah. but they'd already put their application in and that application wasn't going to change probably at that point. Yeah, the we we don't we have not spoken with the actual owners. We've yeah. only spoken. Yeah. We don't know who the owners are. We just yeah. know who the architects are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so in terms of in terms of this question of 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 R eight versus R eight seven, and I know this is not the only one. I you know more generically, you know in terms in terms of the overall plan, are there any are there are there any specific concerns that you have? Um, because I know this isn't the only application coming forward, and I think that's one of your concerns as well. Yeah, I guess the concern that we're we're all having in the neighborhood is, I mean, we will still we still have I think four more that are going to be coming up soon. Um, that they're just everybody's just trying to cram so many people into these small spaces, which is, I mean, I'm I live in a small space, and I think it's great, but I mean, small for a family of three, but they. Just want to, I don't think that bodes for long-term residents to come in, um, which we, we've had, I have people that rent next door to me, they rented there for five years and we're good neighbors. And I think that if people stay longer, there's a sense of community and, and it, they engage with the community and they engage with the city and then they bring their ideas forward. But if, if people in the neighborhoods, in these buildings with hundreds of people, they feel like Mr. Renfrew does that I'm just a renter. When he said that, it actually kind of made me sad. Yeah. But um, but these are people that contribute so much to our community. And I just think with the the height, just to I understand everybody needs to make a profit. I'm not I'm not disillusioned that way. And that just build me a pretty house and and hope for the best. But this is just it's I don't know if there's even going to be a demand for this much housing in here. Um, according to the city plan, they were expecting 5,000 units in between us and Strathcona in 10 years, and we've already have approved or coming up for approval over 2,800 already in in a year. The city plan just came in, so we're just a, we're a little concerned that it's just going to be thrown in haphazard. Everything's just going to be haphazard, and just because everybody wants to build something now and it's not going to look like the same community, which is fine. We like info. We do like development. We don't want a bunch of empty lots just gated off in our neighborhood. That looks terrible. Um, it doesn't feel good either. So we would just like some good development, I guess, is, is the thing, not just cash cow development. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, other questions for... Megan? Not seeing any. Then next will be 
Fred Hurley. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just a, a quick, uh, I realize the hour is late here, but I'll uh, try to run through this as quickly as I can. So my wife uh, and I uh, moved here about five years ago uh, after the Fort McMurray fire. We liked the, loved the community and I went to university here. So we realized it was a great place to live. Uh, I was pretty upset when I heard that uh, there was some development uh, going to happen, particularly in the rezoning. And uh, I, I have some concerns that is, you know, parallels, you know, about the sunlight and the, particularly the traffic and the uh, parking congestion that's going to happen. Uh, particularly if there's a lot of single suites there, I think there's going to be a, a long stream of DoorDash and uh, skip the dishes and coming steadily into that area. And 106 A Street is a one, it's essentially a, a an A Street, as Council is aware, and it's not meant for high traffic. So I've expressed my concern to the City Council, and uh, I heard a little bit back from them, but they suggested that we uh, get our input from the these sessions, which uh, I attended the 26th one, on, uh, but uh, we were put off until today. I've never heard from the developer. So... But I do have a bit of experience with the uh, the developer uh, on that property. Now, after we had moved here in uh, around 2016, 2017, the developer had possession of one of the lots, 8523106 A Street. And at that time, they had wanted to put five, on a single lot, they wanted to put a five-unit apartment. Uh, and they had uh, requested uh, numerous var uh, variances about front entrances and parking, and this was under active consideration by the city administration. Now, at the time, the city uh, said that, you know, the parking, you know, wasn't a big thing for them because they wanted to discourage people from having vehicles in, in these areas. And I thought that was a bit curious, but okay. There was a strong reaction uh, from the community and, and the development did not move forward at that time. Now, the developers have subsequently acquired two the two adjacent lots, and they've come back almost with a vengeance. Uh, they uh, are requesting this rezoning to allow a 50% increase in the height of the buildings. Now, and the city has now uh, taken up their cause on that. So, my current concerns are is that there's been many numerous in, uh, infill developments in this immediate area, and uh, quite recently. And all the developers have done a very good job, I think, in creating really nice, you know, high-end duplexes and uh, smaller apartment blocks. And they've done so within the rules for zoning and aligned with the area plan. And, and this is going to increase density. But it's hardly seemed like fair play when this current proposal would grant a special rezoning for one developer. I don't get it. I'm from Fort McMurray, and maybe you guys do things differently, but... This is essentially an island of RA8 in a pool of RA7, just for them special. So my, I guess, a, a question out there is why? Now, there's been numerous references to the city plan and how it, it intends to increase density. Fair enough. But the R7 zoning increases density. And... Uh, it, you know, the marginal amount of additional housing units or, or, or units is no reason to turn the community on its head. Uh, and besides this, this argument about the city plan, it, I've heard it several times tonight, and it seems everybody is using that as a bit of a hammer to say, uh, you know, the we've got to increase density, okay. But that rationale could apply to every neighborhood in Edmonton. So I, I, I would suggest the city council has to be fairly judicious in how they apply that. Now, also the administration, because I've never heard from the uh, developer or at all, uh, the, I'll just quote a couple lines here. The administration recognizes that the locational criteria for mid-rise apartments uh, is essentially, to paraphrase here, is, is not an effective reference 
and they make reference to the high rises on uh, Saskatchewan Drive. Well, those m many of those uh, high rises have been there a very long time. I had a lot more hair and it wasn't gray. So, uh, so about forty years. So all of a sudden, it's it's the saying well, that it's no longer a use, useful reference tool. So I, I find that okay. So what are the rules going to be applied to our our, our community, our in our neighborhood? Now again, when they're referencing the garden, the garden, I guess as it's called, uh, they make reference to, uh, and I'll just paraphrase here this quickly. Uh, this is demonstrative of the more modest definition of medium density development when the Garneau ARP was written versus current expectations of median density. And I guess my question would be whose expectations? The plan is the plan. <clears throat> so once again, the guidelines are, are deemed to be outdated with current expectations when they don't align with the city's support of this current individual development. The existing zoning fully meets the objectives of the current Garneau ARP. Now the city wants to change the Garneau ARP to make a single exception for this individual development. Sorry, Mr. And it Sorry. Still seems like concierge service. Mr. Hurley, we're a little past the five minutes here now. I'm wondering if you could sum up, please. Okay, so, so I have in, in, in my pre previous residence, I've been on the appeal board in subdivision in Wood Buffalo. So I, I do really appreciate that the council is required to, uh, to weigh the competing equities here. But you have to look at what is the public benefit of granting this one exception? And how do you unring that bell? Thank you, Mr. Hurley. There, okay, thank you. Yeah, I got to I got to stop you there um, and see if there are questions for you. Councillor Henderson, go ahead. Yeah, just just really quickly on that last point, um, you know, because one of the things that I'm struggling with a little bit is not whether or not this is the right thing to do or not. I don't want to. I haven't, you know, to go there yet. But whether or not doing them as one-offs, because we know there are more of these applications coming, so. A larger, would a larger conversation about maybe whether a lot of these RA7s should go up to RA8s be, in your mind, the better way to approach this? Or, uh, or would that raise even more concern? Well, thank you for that question. And, uh, you know, you mentioned the councillor about uh, being consistent about, you know, things like the shadows uh, cast and things like that and how it affects me and my wife. I'm more, uh, honestly, I'm concerned about the shadow being cast on the development process. There just doesn't seem to be a lot of um, transparency. How did we arrive at this one decision? And uh, I think your proposal about maybe doing them in a bunch would, would lend some transparency to the process. But that's just an opinion of a citizen. Well, if, 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 it's, any, if, if it's any consolation, um, these kind of one-off requests are not unique in this city by any means. So thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Hurley? Not seeing any. Um, uh, thanks for choosing Edmonton after what you went through uh, with the fire. Thanks for that. Um, yeah. Thank you. Next. Edmonton really stood up for us. Thanks. Uh, that's what we do. Um, Michael Flanagan is next. Hello. Um, my name is Mike Flanagan, and I live on 106A Street with my wife and my daughter. And I took this picture on Sunday from the streetcar location. And I just want to show you what our street looked like, uh, in case some of you haven't been down. It's a, it's a great neighborhood. But Google Maps is on the right, and access to the street is really quite limited. From the west, the only way in via street is through 85th. From the east, the only way in is through 87th. 86th Avenue does not connect to our street. The laneways on the east side of 106A do not connect to our street. Um, 106A um, goes underneath Saskatchewan Drive, except for right now, that's closed off. And, uh, you know, 
just a point of history. This is old Fort Hill Road, and the original, original fort was down our street. Um, so, you know, it's a, we've got uh, elm trees, ash trees, and now oak trees. It's, it's a lovely little street. Now, I've been listening, and it's curious that we've heard from a renter, two apartment owners, now two homeowners, speaking all against that, against this proposed rezoning. Um, you know, so, you know, that speaks. And also, we're almost hearing from everybody on our short little street speaking against this uh, proposed rezoning. So uh, also the community league spoke against this rezoning. So the administration report had three reasons, and we've heard this for supporting the rezoning to RA8. Uh, moderate increase in building mass. If approved, you know, we'd almost double the living units on this little street, and that will have impacts. Height transition, um, I think with uh, 312, we were talking about shading from one meter difference. We're talking seven meters. Uh, and for those in the feet system, that's 23 feet. Now the presentation shown by Michael DeWolf showed sun, some shadowing, but they did not present December, okay? When the sun angle is the lowest and the daylight's the shortest, and uh, I'd like to see some of those because uh, shading is going to be significant. Um, height transition, yeah, we, we've got homes and we've got walk-ups. And, uh, and then we got that uh, little green space beside the streetcar, and it doesn't fit the height transition that's shown in, in the GARP, the Garneau Area Redevelopment Plan. Close to the U of A, um, it's about 1.8 kilometers to the center, 1.4 to the LRT station. That's not close in my books. Okay. You know, I have no problem with development. Um, there's been... Uh, apartment block, a duplex built on this street in the last five years. I live in an infill from 20 years ago. Um, so no problem with development. And, you know, but this is not compatible with the character of our neighborhood, the, the history of this neighborhood. Um, six stories will be quite a change. And, uh, you know, this is you know part of the reason why I'm against the current rezoning proposal. Um, and in fact, you know, if you look at the community engagement, all of those in favor, all their comments could be addressed by an RA7. There is no reason we need to go to RA8. Okay? I've lived in Edmond 20 years. I've been on the street for 10 years of those 20. If this goes ahead, and if it's as bad as I fear, maybe my fears are unfounded, but if it's bad as I fear, fear, I may seriously consider moving back to the suburbs. I, I live in Black Mud Creek, great place. And I know that there won't be a six-story building built behind me or in front of me or beside me. So, and with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Flanagan. Questions on that? Councillor Henderson? Yeah, can you, you're, you're in one of the buildings across the street, correct? That is correct. Yeah. So, um, so what do you think the you know the difference between the four stories and the six stories? What what's the specific effect that most concerns you about that? Well, there's a number. Um, shading is one of them. Um, you know, I took a picture uh, just around March 21st, and the trees were casting shadows on my porch, and the trees will be shorter than the, the proposed building. So that's and density, you know, as I said, in terms of living units, it'll double, almost double the number of living units on this street. And as as you saw in that map, you know, access is restricted, so, so there's going to be a, a lot more people. So the so the concern, because again, we, we talk about density, and I know people worry about density, but I, I'd like to dig in and try and find what, you know, is the worry the traffic piece of the density question? Or do you have it's, other worries it, about the density as well, about having more people? Well, you know, it's more people and, you know, there'll be more busyness and not just foot traffic, you know, car traffic, you know, as Mr. Hurley said, I know most of my neighbors on the street. And, you know, as he said, there'll be skip the dishes and deliveries, Amazon, 
uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there'll be a lot more people on the street, potential for noise. Uh, Mr. Nash, who I know, uh, owns one of the apartment blocks and uh, he, he runs a tight ship and it's quiet and that's great. Um, so, you know, it's just the, the number of people and, you know, the concerns can be met with an RA7. That, that's my argument. There's no need to rezone. No, uh, no, absolutely. And, and, and you would see a significant increase in the number of people with RA7 as well. So I'm just really trying to get would increase. Yeah. 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 It's just that extra increase on such a short street yeah. with two bookends. Like yeah. it, it's, it, it's a short dead end street at both yeah. ends. And, and you, you know, to get out at the, at the Northern end, the only way ever is by the lane, correct? It's, there's a lane out and that's it. You can go on 80, it's still called 87th if, if you That's go north, <laughs> um, but it's a, really a lane. Yeah, it's, a one, yeah. it's supposed to be one way, but people, because the, the bridge Dugan is uh, being worked on for the year, people go down the one way all the time the but wrong way, can, even though it's but even well when, Even when that bridge is under construction, that, that Fort, Fort Hill is one way up. You can't go down that hill. Except for city employees are allowed to go down to go to well, the station I think, down. I don't think they're allowed. They may choose to. I don't think they have a. No, actually, actually, the sign says they're allowed oh, to. Okay, yeah, because really? there's no it other way to get there. <laughs> they're used to. Yeah. All right. Okay, thanks. Any other questions for Mr. Flanagan? Not seeing any. So thank you to our speakers. Uh, I'll ask you all to mute yourselves for the moment. There will be an opportunity for new information once we have um, had the chance to ask some questions of uh, city planners. So, Councillor Henderson, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, um, and again, I know this isn't the only one coming asking the same question, but we have RA7, RA8 for a reason. And, you know, uh, clearly we had another one before us today where RA8 was discouraged in a fairly similar situation. So, you know, on the larger planning question, I, I'm really struggling to understand why this site, mid-block, where we already have RA7, from a planning point of view, makes sense to basically do a 50%. You know, because a, a, it, you know, an RA building is, having seen now a number of these six-story buildings, they're fairly significant buildings in terms of height, and are in, a, in a way that RA7, you know, hits the roof, hits the treetops in a different way. It just has a different kind of feel to it. So under what circumstances do we think RA7 is appropriate? Under what circumstances do we think RA8 is appropriate? Because I think that's the essential question we have to struggle with here a little bit. Otherwise, I'm not sure why we distinguish between the two. No, that's a good question, Councillor, and I'll get uh, Holly Mickelson uh, to answer that for you. Councillor Henderson, um, as we outlined in the report um, and in the presentation, the differences between the RA7 and the RA8 are pretty minimal. Um, but as you point out, there are changes and yeah. are differences. And but the difference the, of the, the two street, stories the allows the, the some variation. I mean, the feel of the street wall is quite different. Um, I, you know, I would argue it isn't, you know, I mean, the, the, the scale of the street wall is significantly different between RA7 and RA8. Now that I've seen some of the six-story buildings, you know, it, it's got a different feel. There's no question about it. It's not good or bad. It's just different. So when when would when would that when would we look at that as part of the impact, um, and when we think it makes sense, and when we don't think it makes sense? Well, I think it's important to look at these as a case by case basis. And in this situation, um, specifically the height transition policy in the Grano ARP of 2.1 talks about um, that transition and where it's appropriate um, transitions between zones of different scales. So the reason why we've suggested that RA8 is appropriate in this location adjacent to RA7 is that we feel that those are co um, compatible zones together and zones of similar scales. So yes, there is a different street wall effect and there is an additional two stories and the additional density, but being compatible zones and allowing that variation in height and a little bit of a variation in the built form on the street is important as well. Um, so, I mean, it, under that argument that we would, so theoretically anywhere we have RA7, we would now be considering RA8 in, in it, in between it? I, I think it would be a case by case basis on if no, it was appropriate. If so I, that's what I'm really struggling with is to understand what makes this, you know, to go back, what makes this case special? 
Um, but because I, you know, I also understand, I mean, and, the, and the, this is the problem with this, is there's a kind of inevitability of these decisions. If we start saying we're going to consider RA8 and RA7 zones, we're going to affect the cost of land, and you're going to just see a whole bunch less RA7 built. You're, and we could end up freezing more land. Um, so, you know, I th there's a larger question here that I'm struggling with. I, you know, I, I sort of get it that, you know, I think for the people around them, um, there are significant impacts to this, but there's a larger question that I'm struggling with here. I mean, these are neighborhoods that have very successfully densified way before anybody else did using a template that used RA7. And, and we've upped the RA, correct me if I'm wrong, but this would have been, the RA7 would have been constrained to three stories until three years ago, would it not? Would have been on um, the RA seven was um, four stories um, has but been four stories for longer than three years. Uh, no, but the overlays were on this on, on these properties. I think. Oh, sorry. Yes, yeah. the overlays were on this location. Yeah. So, um, the medium density yeah. did Which is exist. Why the building on, on the other side would have been constrained to two and a half or three stories when it was built in the eighties? So, Councillor, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, that's true. Councillor, I think if we uh, pull up a little bit and go back to your original question as to why an RA8 is good at this location and um, and how it works within the larger context of both city plan and its location within the city. Uh, we're next to a major node, uh, one of the two major nodes in the city, which is the University Garneau node, uh, as also as well as the 109th Street corridor. Um, and as you noted, uh, this area has had density for quite some time. Uh, these buildings uh, that are in the RA7 right now uh, are typically built in the 1960s and 1970s. And as we advance, uh, you know, through decades, uh, we're now 40, 50, 60 years on, uh, there is a incremental, uh, I guess, view that a compatibility of a six story and a four story is appropriate. Um, and if we take an even a longer view, uh, to when, say, this building will be uh, functionally obsolete in another 50 or 60 years, uh, that additional two stories uh, over 100 years, uh, that difference seems to decrease quite a bit. Um, so you have that contextual argument that you have city plan that's saying that this is a, a major node uh, and next to a major node that needs to uh, further those densification goals, uh, as well as a contextual piece where a four story next to a six story uh, can those transitions can be accommodated quite successfully. Okay, I'm out of time. I will need another round. Thank you. Um, any other questions for administration? I'll move a second round. Thank you, Councillor Knack. I'll second that. Second. And oh, just okay. uh, Councillor McKean has got the second then. Uh, I'll just seek unanimous consent. Any objection to? Uh, let me just double check who's present. Um, Councillor Cartmel has been able to rejoin us. Okay, so I'm here. Yep. Oh, great. Okay, welcome back. Um, and uh, so, from those present, then, uh, is there any objection? Not hearing any. Okay, uh, carry on, Councillor Henderson. Yeah, and just to go back on that point, then I want to ask some questions about the traffic piece. My my concern is that that's that represents a, more than a kind of one-off ad hoc response to, to the existing plan that's worked really well for us. And that's my worry about all of these, is that we're backing into something without really asking the larger question, which I think is a larger question, about whether or not, you know, really we're saying that RA7s in this kind of context, in this kind of area, are now fair game to be RA8. I, and I'm not saying that's necessarily wrong. I just worry a little bit that this isn't the way to have that conversation. Well, there's a number of pieces that are going on right now since the passing of the city plan. Uh, district plans are being worked on, but we are in this, we'll call it an uncomfortable period where we have higher level policy direction uh, that in sometimes contradicts and contravenes that lower level policy direction in the ARPs or the guidelines. Uh, so as we advance and move forward in these years, we can't just stop development. Yeah. Uh, we have to recognize how that yeah, I get fits it. within the city plan yeah. until we get that strong direction yeah. from dist district planning. My only worry about that is that the GARP is one of the ones we haven't put on the table to look at yet because it's effectively working and has worked really well in terms of getting getting density. And, that's, and I, I just worry a little bit about taking a working plan and undermining it like this. So... Um, anyway, I'll, I, I'll, 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 I'm sorry, I'm, I'm still thinking this one through. I wanted to check, though, before I run out of time a second time, because uh, yeah, about um, uh, uh, the, the traffic concerns on, a, on, on what really is a, a dead-ended street with, with very little way out at the, at the one end. 
um, and and it's a one-way street coming in. So um, and uh, and adding adding the level of traffic that we'd be looking at here and what the concern is around that. Mr. Saeed. Yes, uh, Councillor Henderson, uh, we have looked at it, and I think uh, the first and foremost, this is one of uh, the areas that has uh, uh, really good options in terms of uh, choosing alternative modes. Uh, recent uh, uh, neighborhood rehab has further enhanced uh, the opportunities to use the pedestrian and cyclist infrastructure. As far as the traffic generation itself is concerned, uh, uh, the scale of development is such that uh, it will had probably in the realm of 15, 20 vehicles during the peak hour, if even we don't consider any modal split. Modal split for this area is around 50%. So that gives us the comfort that this location-wise, it's uh, uh, it's not an issue. And and what about the parking piece of the puzzle? Because I know, you know, this is the one part of Garneau that does not have a parking permit plan in place. Um, it's not because they haven't wanted it. But because of the nature of the kind of buildings that are there, they've never been able to get the 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 pub, the, you know, the fifty percent support because so many of the buildings are owned by people who don't live there. Um, so there, that's there is a con I have a concern around that around the constraint of parking, um, and I'm just wondering if we've had a look at that piece of the puzzle. Correct. Uh, so parking is definitely restricted. Uh, One hundred six A Street. Uh, um, uh, east side of east side is restricted for parking. 106 Street is uh, separated bike lanes, so there are no opportunities there. Uh, as far as uh, uh, the right amount of parking uh, to be provided, I think uh, we will rely on uh, the proponent to look at some uh, uh, parking uh, management strategies as well. Uh, looking at the car share program, giving incentives for transit passes. There are a number of things that can be done in order to uh, not necessarily increase the supply, but reduce the supply and manage the parking in a better way. Great. Um, well, thank you. Those are my questions. Any other questions for administration? Not seeing any um, any new information. I think Mr. DeWolf uh, had had uh, something to say earlier, uh, so now would be uh, a good time, uh, Mr. DeWolf. Sure, thank you. Um, so yeah, there was a, a number of uh, in uh, conversations and the mis I guess interpretation of the amount of units. There was a number of conversations that they said that were sixty. Uh, there's only 51 units being proposed for this uh, site, so that uh, we wanted to correct that. And and also uh, the information is that the um, the entrance to the parkade is is coming from uh, the back alley. Sorry, I think we are you still there, Mr. DeWolf? Yeah. Hello. Th this is Jason Barclay. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Sorry. Um, is it Mr. Barclay's presenting at this point then? Uh, I'm just, yeah, so Mr. DeWolf and Mr. Barclay are in the same room. Right, okay. Uh, yeah. Then carry on, Mr. Barclay. Yeah, so, you know, we just kind of wanted to iterate that uh, um, the parkade is is being designed uh, to uh, entrance in the back alley. So there's going to be a less impact on the, on the, um, uh, the traffic on the front street uh, because of that. And that... Um, there was some discussion that there was a thought that there was 60 units and there's only 51 uh, being proposed in, in the building. Thank you. Questions on that, Councillor Well, Anderson? just out of curiosity, because I don't want to have to go back and ask administration this, but um, if it had been an RA7 um, and you were constrained to four stories, how many units would that be? Well, basically, how many units do you have per floor? Uh, there, if, if we were to jam uh, uh, the units and not put any parking on, there would be probably 42, 41, 42 units so with adds, no parking. So it adds an extra 10 units and you, and you wouldn't have yeah. parking. Okay. Yeah. Um, but so, so, sorry, we wanted to be committed to making sure that we had little impact, right? So that's why we committed to the parkade. Right. Um, and the parkade will give you uh, two, uh, uh, about 
It won't give you one unit per, per won't give you one stall per unit. It gives you about a 60 or 70 percent? 65 percent, I believe. Okay. Um, so you're, you're prepared then to be renting to folks that don't have cars, I presume? Yeah, there's um, a, a mix of uh, studios that uh, we anticipate the students to, to use without, uh, without vehicles. Okay. And, and, and we do have in our business plan a, a car share um, incorporated in that. So we, we are anticipating to do uh, a car share in, in, the, in the program. Because you, you recognize that, you recognize that, um, that on-street parking there is virtually non-existent. Yes, yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Barclay? Um, maybe uh, I'll just ask one. Councillor Henderson, could you take the chair for a moment? So, um, you know, we've seen from the presentation material what the development concept uh, is, is that... Um, uh, and and uh, what Councillor Henderson was asking for has led to, I'll have a follow-up question for administration about development potential within the envelope of RA8. Um, is that essentially what you are, are you, how far down the path are you on design on that and are you fairly committed to that, that form at this point? Yeah, you know what, um, you know, we were um, very conscious and we, we want to create um, uh, what I would say meaningful architecture, right? And we wanted to make sure that uh, we weren't going to be uh, the ones down the street that we're going to do just a cheap vinyl siding with a, a blank wall. Um, so we are on the one yard line of submitting our application uh, like you see on the, um, on the rendering. Uh, so that it's our a strong intent to um, make application based on what you see um, and uh, create meaningful architecture. So we've we put a lot of uh, effort um, into creating something that's uh, meaningful in the area. So yes, to answer your question, uh, what you see is what we intend to uh, submit for application. Okay, and I have to be a bit careful with that question because what's really before us is is the zoning, um, but that's just helpful context for one more follow-up question of administration for me. So thank yeah. you, um, Mr. Barclay. Um, then from those registered in opposition, I'll just go one at a time uh, uh, to see if you've got new information. Uh, Kyle Remfer, is there any new information which arose that you wish to address? Uh, no. Okay, thank you. Mr. Nash? Yes, uh, in response to what the developer just said about the number of suites, in, in his performa in March that was submitted, I guess, to the Garno uh, Community League, um, it said that they wanted to build 53 suites and with 23 parking stalls. And uh, now, of course, they bring up the the notion that they're going to rent the building to students who don't have vehicles. Well, I can tell you as the adjacent property owners that I've had students who apparently didn't have initially any vehicles, but it ended up having two of them. We have 19 parking stalls for 16 suites and every one of them is full. So from a development point of view and ownership, uh, it looks like rental suicide to me to try to design and run a building like that. The, the parking is going to be an enormous issue with people coming, delivering food. Uh, we've got the ride share issue. So somebody's going to be coming in there. Cars are going to be, you know, uh, piled up here when they're, everybody's buddy is trying to get into the car and waiting for the next one and it's just going to be a nightmare so re7 is a is a, a very valid zoning that exists already we've shown that it has been changed in you know in august of 2019 so instead of building that all you could build on the same lot size of 16 suites, now you can build 40, depending on the size of them. So the issue of economics, whether or not you're going to put in underground parking, 
is irrelevant. I can tell you at uh, Kativa Apartments on 84th Avenue, 10638, it has 25 suites, three stories, and it has underground parking. You go down to 80th Avenue and 105th Street, it's got about 16 suites. They're all two bedrooms, underground parking. So it's not an issue of economics for an underground parking lot in an RA7 zone. It's, that's just uh, what, what they're trying to do is maximize uh, their development situation. And going to RA8 has so many disadvantages that the existing zoning already uh, would allow. Thank you, Mr. Nash. Any questions for Mr. Nash on the new information? Not seeing any. Next, then, is Cal Lang. Mr. Lang, are you there? Any new yes, questions? I am, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I think a couple things that have come up that are very important is uh, Mr. Henderson said that there is no parking on the street, and it was confirmed by the architect. And there isn't. There's no place for a, 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 somebody to come and visit those people because it's, it's very, very difficult to get parking. Second thing is, I do not believe, as a builder who started, uh, I didn't start this company, my father started this company in 1963, so 58 years ago, I do not believe that they can't make a go of it financially with an R. F7. That's it. Thank you. Questions on that? Not seeing any. Um, Megan Rich? No, I think people have pretty well addressed everything. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Hurley, any new information? Uh, just a final point uh, to follow up with Mr. Lang, and I, I feel that Many other the developers in the area have uh, made a go of it with the RA7 zoning, and I don't see why the city should uh, have to guarantee be a guarantor of uh, you know, rezoning something just for somebody to say it's viable. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any questions on that. Mr. Flanagan, new information? Okay. Yeah, I'm on my porch, and uh, uh, this will be my last comment with the video. And here's the parking on the street, and this is normal. There's the three homes that are going to be uh, replaced with the rezoning. One's fairly decent, two of them are old. Um, and you know, to give you an idea, those trees there do not go up to the height of the new building. Okay? Um, so, and they're, they do tower over the RA7 four story across the street. Thank you. Thank you. Virtual public hearings have really allowed us to see the context much better. So thank you for the tour, Mr. Flanagan. Um, You're welcome. Uh, Councillor Henderson, if you could take the chair. So um, uh, just building on what I asked, I mean, RA8, which we've talked about a lot as a standard zone, comes with uh, uh, certain entitlements, obviously. So folks have said you can build whatever, but it's not quite whatever. It's bounded by what what's in the zoning at, at the time of application. If it were RA8, uh, did we do, you know, we, we've seen some of those massing models and if it was in the presentation, I missed it, I apologize. But have we done them? Well, two questions. First of all, I can't remember the specifics of RA8, but there are some smaller site considerations and larger site considerations. Or is that RA9 that has uh, sort of Depending on the size of the site, it has some different rules around setbacks and mass. That's the RA9. With oh, the, that's the 9. Okay. Sizes. Okay. That's why I couldn't find it in the 8 then. So, um, okay. So there's a certain set of rules um, for, in this case, a three lot parcel. That'll define what's buildable within it. D did we do a massing study of notwithstanding what the applicant has submitted, which has some angles and other things that provide some mitigation, but... But since we're looking at the standard zoning, which runs with the land, have we done a, a massing analysis uh, with the step back and setback requirements and everything else that we can see? So in the presentation, um, I believe it's slide four, there's a table on there and uh, Ms. Mickelson will take you through that. 
Okay. Um, we did this table comparison. We did not do a massing model comparison um, as the differences are uh, pretty minimal. Um, so as you can see in the R8 zone, uh, one of the key differences is the height of the zone, slightly larger FAR, um, and then the minimum densities. And those minimum densities translate to um, a minimum of five in RE7, and a minimum of nine in RE8. Obviously, that's not what the applicant has um, stated that their intent is. These setbacks on all sides are identical. And then commercial uses, which, again, the applicant has said they do not intend to proceed with, um, are limited at grade. Okay. Um, so it's on the... And, and the... Um Okay, what was throwing me off here, I think, then, because I remember looking at this table and trying to unpack it and look for step backs. Um, but step backs in the zones would only kick in if there's um, ground oriented development next door. Is that? That's correct. Okay, so there's, so it would be straight up at 1.2 meters, whether it's four stories or whether it's. Six. So on the north and south sides, um, you uh, th sorry, there would still be a setback or a setback increase to three meters over ten meters in height to create that step back to adjacent properties, but that would only be on the north and south sides. And that not is, on the lane. And that is the same for both R Same for both zones. And is that what then forces the slope and the notching effectively in, in the design that we've seen? Yes, so some developers opt to increase the setback entirely at the ground floor, um, but alternatively, um, the RA zone does require that additional step back above 10 meters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember seeing in Tokyo, they have these sight line things that create all these really interesting sloped um, roofs on these angular planes, and I wondered if that was what was driving the design here, so hence hence the questions. Um, but unpacking the um, unpacking this table allows me to imagine the sort of rectangular prism exercise that we saw in the the, the RF five earlier. So so thank you. That's helpful. Um, I'll take the chair back. Um, and strictly speaking, I need to see if there's any other new information arising from the last line of questions. not hearing any, then we have arrived at the moment of some kind of decision. The next step would be closure of the public hearing if there's nothing else. Well, I'm, I'm still struggling with what I'm going to do, but I'm happy to move closure of the public okay. hearing. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Second. Uh, thank you, Councillor McKean. Please vote to close public hearing. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Zadek. I'll move first reading if oh, that's hold on, helpful. Hold on just a second. Yeah, I'll come back to you for that in a moment. Uh, we've just got to finish uh, tallying the vote. Have we got it? Okay, display it, please. EScribe must have had a, f a filling dinner as well. It's, uh, it, it reports that closure of the public hearing has passed unanimously. Councillor McKean is prepared to put the motion on the floor. I second. will and second move to Councillor McKean. Okay. Uh, did you wish to speak to it, Councillor McKean? Uh, no, I was just doing that as formality for, for Councillor Henderson. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to speak to it. Councillor Henderson, go ahead. Yeah, I've, I've been swaying back and forwards on this all evening um, or all afternoon and evening. I, you know, my... I'm not convinced. I think we're being a little bit cavalier with thinking that there's not that much difference between RA7 and RA8, which isn't to say that we don't need to be going towards the RA8s, but I think we need to do it a little bit more intentionally and with a little bit more thought. And that's what I'm getting hung up on here. Um, I actually think in terms of, in terms of, you know, and we've got a whole bunch of this stuff coming in Garno, quite frankly, and I was prepared to support, I think, in the, in the context of what happened Ironically, on the building that, that, uh, that, I, that I did support for another reason, because it wasn't R8, I think the six stories made sense there. But I'm not convinced on a constrained street like this, on, a, on a basically a half-block street, mid-block, 
Um, you know, having looked at some of the street walls you get from, from, from a six-story building, I think we need to be more careful and more thoughtful about, and, I, and it worries me that we're thinking they're the same thing. Because um, I don't know if they are, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm not convinced that this is a special enough circumstance to say that automatically it should get the, 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 two, the two floors up um, without some real thought about what that actually means to communities like these and streets like these. Uh, the, one of the reasons, and I've never been able to substantiate this, but um, one of the things that I think was used as a template for why we ended up with some of the heights we've ended up in neighborhoods like these was exactly the tree canopy, um, was that these buildings were the same height as the tree canopy and not above it. It's really interesting. I was, I was uh, on top of uh, one of the buildings in Old Strathcona the other day and looked over to see the new building that is six stories that did get built on the old gas station. And it, is, it really stands out um, when you look in above. It's a much, much bigger and taller and more imposing building than anything else around it. And, I, and that has a setback, you know, that has a step back rather um, at, at the top two floors to try and make it feel less imposing on the street and it's still imposing. So I, I think we're being, I, I worry, you know, I think it, in terms of the design of this building and what's being intended, and I think, and I'm torn because I understand that, you know, that, that this gives other benefits like the underground parking, and I think that's legitimate. I, there's just a larger question here in terms of a plan that has been working and has been working well to create the second densest neighborhood we have in the city, that we are playing with fire in terms of taking it apart like this and dismissing a difference, which is actually, this will now be double the building that would have been allowed, double the height of the building that would have been allowed three years ago. And, and it's um, in, in a neighborhood that has been working in terms of identification, that has taken huge density in the last 10, 20 years, and have done so willingly and has done so under a plan that they're very proud of. Um, and I, I I think if we want to have a conversation about changing that, we need to do it in a planning context and not in a one-off ad hoc context. And I think with some reluctance, because I don't think, I think we, we have some much bigger ones coming up still in Garneau, but with some reluctance, I think I'm going to vote no, and I really wasn't sure until now, because I, I do think there's a larger planning exercise and a larger planning context that we need to understand, and I, I worry a little bit that we think we're, there's no real difference between a four-story building and a six-story building, because I think in these residential contexts, in terms of that street wall, in terms of what it feels like to be on those streets, there is a difference, and we need to understand that and not be quite so dismissive of it. So I will be voting no. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Anyone else wishing to speak? Councillor Knack? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as per usual, I appreciate Councillor Henderson's um, perspective and recognizing that, you know, just recently we, you know, I didn't support something uh, for some other reasons and we, we're not going to spend time on that debate today. Um, I'm, I'm not feeling the same way about this as I felt about the one we just talked about yesterday and the time before. And, uh, you know, I want to, uh, for me, I appreciate the point that, that you raised, and I, and I think back to some of the other discussions we've had in the past about not wanting to sort of do things as a one-off. You know, I spent a lot of time <laughs> and failed a lot of <laughs> votes uh, on changes like to, from RF1 to RF3 because we hadn't done the broader work under the city plan. And now that we have that, I was able to then support some of those uh, additional changes because I felt we had the planning rationale behind it. So I appreciate the point, though, that you've raised around the, the notion that this is a plan that is still working um, and we'll be dealing with a, for a later conversation, not today, but others in the future about what plans are and what plans aren't working. And so I, I recognize and appreciate your point around wanting to be thoughtful about going outside of those plans, even with the city plan in mind. I'm just not right now feeling the same concern about this particular change. And yes, there is a difference, as you, as you stated, between 
you know, a six story building and a four story building. I think that's fair. Um, this block and I, and I do know it, I've, I've ridden around it, uh, as, as I'm sure many folks have, it's a beautiful area to ride around. Um, but I'm just, I'm not, I'm not as swayed right now by that point on this particular site with the design of it. And back to this point a bit earlier is that when I think about what could be allowed there today versus what's being proposed, I think there's some positive aspects here that, um, that are more beneficial than what could be there under that standard RA7 RA zoning. So certainly interested if other folks have a perspective right now and, and choose to share that. But where I'm at today actually would be likely supporting it at this moment. Um, so just wanted to share my thoughts where I'm at at this moment, but appreciating your points that you've raised, Councillor Henderson. Thank you. Thank you. Um, others? I might close briefly. Go ahead, Councillor McKean. Yeah, I, and I want to uh, I want to thank Councillor Henderson. He always he always really makes me think, and uh, and I appreciate his thoughts on this. Um, and I think he's probably doing what he should be doing. I was not, with all due respect to all our speakers today, I was not, I did not find any of the submissions convince me that there would be significant material impact to anyone's lives. There's already no parking in the area. So there's no parking uh, public curb for the um, the developer to exploit. So he is compelled then to look after his customers, his renters or purchasers, or he will not rent or sell units in that building. The two stories, I don't find that a, um, a significant material difference. Uh, I don't think we heard that today. And the number of people, um, you know, uh, people out on the street, people on bikes, I don't think there can be a ton of extra uh, traffic because the roadway doesn't allow it. So, um, and it's a new build going in, and I think it fits that 15-minute um, template we have in the city plan. I. Andrew Knack could certainly ride his bike to the university within 15 minutes. Um, and um, so I, I, I have a tough time. I understand the technical argument, the fundamental argument about uh, RA7 versus RA8 and how we shouldn't one off these. But oh my God, the number of times uh, that we've seen other ARPs, Oliver in particular, that have had amendments in them. Um, it does happen and it will happen. And I don't think we can delay all development while we do that broader work that Councillor Henderson would like to see us do. I appreciate his argument. I appreciate all the submissions tonight, but I will be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McKean. Please vote. We're just missing a, a few votes. Um, Councillor Banga? Yes, for me. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. I, I think I heard another voice, but I, I missed who it was and what they said. Um, and if I misheard, we're, we're also missing Councillor Hamilton. Yes. Thank you, and Councillor Paquette. Yes. Thank you. We have 12 votes. Display the vote, please. That's carried 10 to 2. Mr. Mayor, I will move second reading.
Thank you. Second. Second. Thank you, Councillor Banga. Please vote. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. Yes. Me as well, please. Thank you, Councillors Banga and Hamilton. Just missing Councillor Paquette. Yes. Thank you. We have 12 votes. Display the vote. Carried. Mr. Mayor, I will move consideration of third reading. Second. Thank you. Please vote to allow third reading to proceed. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Councillors Banga and Hamilton. We have 12 votes. Display the vote. That's carried. Mr. Mayor, I will uh, move third reading on bylaw 19534 and charter bylaw 19535. Second. Third and final reading, please vote. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Catter. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Yes, for me as well. Give each crowd a break. Thank you, Councillor Banga. And we have 12 votes. Display the vote. Carried 10 to 2. Okay. I think that's all the business, unless there are any subsequent motions or any notices of motion. Hearing none, then we are adjourned. Thank you.